Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to the strategy group meeting. Um, first of all, can I sign the minutes off the meeting held on the 5th of July? Yes. Just say you're with the second stage. Follow this for absence. No, I think we're all here actually. Uh, declarations of members' interests. Declare them now on the time of the meeting when the item comes up. Okay, so we move on to our first item tonight, how to develop mental health issues. Uh, public space protection order, enhanced adopt control powers, council order. Yeah, thank you. Um, do I stand on this one or can I no, sit? It's like a silver yeah. 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 I, I would certainly stand out of respect. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this uh, is, is uh, a consultation that took place with regard to providing enforcement officers with new and enhanced powers tackle dog fouling and other forms of irresponsible dog ownership with regard to our um, PSPOs, the Public Space Protection Orders. You'll also see in there also is about the prohibitation of smoking defining children's play areas, so there's an additional one, it's not only dogs. On the 24th of May, the strategy group approved the commencement of a consultation process to extend and increase the current protection powers, which are currently fouling, um, exclusion from fenced off toddlers and play areas, directions to put dogs on a lead, dogs on a lead in a specified area, and provisions of means of a suitable receptacle to pick up dog food. So those are currently in place. Consultation went out with regard to whether those should remain and whether we need any further. And you will see as a result of the consultation process, which is at Appendix 1, we have come up with, and if you turn to page 8, um, 4.15, um, the uh, current proposals for the new um, order. Now, I'll go through them one by one and then we can debate them with regard to how strategy feel with regard to progressing them. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to include the current five. Yeah. There seems to be support on that. Uh, they seem to be working well. And we seem to be dealing with this problem, which is pretty intractable, as it is, uh, many districts and boroughs suffer from these sort of problems. But all in all, there seems to be a good blend of enforcement and of encouragement and of education, which helps us deal with um, the minority of irresponsible dog owners. Uh, the next one is to dogs on elite near schools. Now, oh, um, graveyards. Yeah. Sorry? Graveyards. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, graveyards. If you go to page 15, um, which is part of the appendix, it gives you the detail of the um, consultation, and you will see that there is strong agreement that we should have dogs on meat in graveyards. Yeah. And there was just a, a scenario that, that, that came to mind with regard to why I feel we should follow through on this particular one, is that you can imagine a dog being loose, even if the uh, dog owners are responsible and pick up after their dog, if a dog is allowed to roam free on there and just happens to go up to a grave, cock its leg and pee all over the gravestone. That has got to have a massive impact on individuals that would witness that, and that can't be right. So I think out of dignity and respect uh, for those people that go there to mourn and to be with their loved ones in some form, that we should have a little bit of respect. We're not saying dogs are not in graveyards, because I'm sure that many people who lost loved ones would probably take a pet dog along to be part of that memorial. Uh, uh, but it's about making sure that there is respect in that area. So I strongly um, would, agree, would strongly suggest that we, we, we allow that one. With your agreement, I'd like to go through. Is there any objections to the actual recommendation here? Can we just discuss it for the item? Yeah, should we go so one got, by one? Got, clearly, the first one we've done, the second one, including this one. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm happy with those you've said so far. Are you going through these? Yeah, go through them one by one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, okay. fine, fine. This one, Richard. Okay, uh, number two is dogs on leads near schools. Page 17 of the appendix gives you the detail of that. Um, I, I would uh, like to rephrase um, the actual proposal here is to, uh, it's to amend it to dogs on leads near school entrances and exits during its term time. I'd like to further change that to um, amend to read dogs on leads in defined areas near school entrances and exits during term time. The reason for this is, is what is close to an entrance and an exit? 
I think there is some subjectiveness there. So I would ask officers to define the area near that school entrance and exit so that everybody's in clear exactly what we are talking about. Because uh, is it 100 metres, is it 50 metres? So I'm wondering whether it would be possible to make that slight amendment if we could. There is public support with it, and I would uh, suggest we go with it. Okay, so it's not really to go to that one. Yeah, through you, Chairman, that is possible because uh, the practice of the SPO would normally have a diagram of where areas are included okay. anyway. So that is. That's uh, great. Uh, I, would, I would accept that. Yeah, so with regard to any enforcement on it, it's quite clear is it in or out? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Wesley. Yeah, I mean, where, where, where is near the school? Where is the entrance? You have rear entrances, front entrances. Some schools are fairly large sites, and I know a lot of them are fenced off now, but there are still entrance points to that. I mean, if you if you go around the town, I mean, there's um, you know, you're talking about uh, schools near near fields, and um, it's it just seems it just seems a little bit mad to me. I think we've got enforcement controls on uh, on people looking after dogs, and I think they should be used, not an extra one. I think I'll come back to the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Griffin. Uh, would we have to put a notice up? And the people, that's going to be more expensive. Right. Yeah, through each other. We, we do have, every time we update the orders, there is a requirement for a small amount of notices and things mm. to be changed or added to. Mm. So, yes, we would. That's a habit. Yeah, um, I've got a problem with the whole thing, uh, to be honest with you, but um, I don't see how you can police it. I don't think it's policed by officers at the moment. Um, and whenever it, um, members of the public or Met elected members ask the officers for information on what is and isn't uh, a problem with dog owners and re request information. They don't get any replies. <coughs> so if we're not getting replies from officers, I don't even know any of this can go through tonight. Well, uh, I don't even know how you can actually have this go through to people who don't live in the area, don't know anything about how we can do things. Well, how can well, you manage it? Well, well, we mentioned about science, we come back to that one, but I just want to say, in terms of officer responses, Maria. Uh, yeah, through you, Chairman, we would, we, we would be able to have conversations with schools and communities with regard to where is appropriate sites, for example. Um, but any and all of our environmental crime enforcement is wholly reliant on the cooperation of local residents, parish councils, community groups. They are the people that report every time we've prosecuted or investigated, it's because people are doing that reporting. So that is how we do it. We do it in partnership with the public who want us to do this enforcement. Enforcement is a last resort. What you ideally want is all the education and all the measures in place. To, but the vast majority of people, when you say, you no, know, only dogs are needs here, they com they're compliant. So we don't actually, enforcement is the last resort. This is about educating and ensuring we're doing what the public want. Thank you. Can I come back on that, please? Oh, sorry, yeah, and, and the lack of response to elected members who ask for information from the officers regarding the, or the two officers I, I'm not aware of any instances, but if, if you if you're not get, if you're if you want anybody wants information, um, my policy towards the member inquiry is to answer within a couple of days wherever possible. So if you're after information, we we'll can give you information. You have evidence that very good. Yeah, just, just I'll refer you to emails. me and we'll sort it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Are there any more points on this particular item before we go to motions? We can just can double over two points. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, um, you know, so we have a view, absolutely, and I think we're entitled to our opinions on this. This is what the public want. You know, there has been consultation. What's the point of consulting the public if we don't try and, and, and do things which they want to help improve the quality of life for residents in this area? That's the first point. The next point is one of example with regard to schools. You know, uh, in my previous life, I dealt with a couple of incidents where there were issues with regard to loose dogs in areas of the school. Now, of course, you are right. There is legislation to deal with that. But why are we having legislation to deal with uh, somebody actually being frightened and bit when we have an opportunity to actually prevent that in the first place? You know, we go on and on about prevention, and when we have an opportunity to have a tactic which prevents, uh, we get sort of shy about it. And finally, with regard to policing, uh, I was very much like uh, uh, Councillor Howard with regard to policing, thinking, what's the point of putting in um, these orders, uh, you know, fixed coming notice, when actually where is the enforcement? But by, by the very fact that you have a PSPO that states that this is unacceptable, that this is, you will have compliance. 
we're all only talking and ever only talking about a minority of individuals that are irresponsible. Most of the public will be compliant with regards to the communication strategy, so which hopefully you will be leading on, and the notices that we put up to ensure that people understand what is expected with regard to dogs in school areas. Thank you, Mr. Dean, Councillor Olga. I'll be happy to agree the recommendation on that line. Okay, I thought we'd done the discussion. Sorry. So I, 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 I'm, I'm not clear if. Um, if uh, I, so it's going to be late. So what yeah, we do well is we go through on 4.15, we go through each line there. Which we I appreciate that, but, but, but have, you, have, you, have you reached the end? No, no, we're on the, we're I on the, have the part. We're on the fourth one down. Yeah, my, no, so my on fourth one down. I, I, dog I, on these near schools. Never two of both agreed. Yeah. Okay. So on the third one there, are we agreed to the third one there? Dogs on these near schools with the amendment of the defined area. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Okay, um, you'll see that uh, the next three are not included because there isn't public support. Actually, right. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to then move on to the We're restriction. Everyone's happy with that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I'd like to go on to the restriction of the number of dogs at walks at one time. Now, I, I think that we do need to have a little debate on this, so I'll give my opening salvo, but I would like to come back to uh, answer any concerns. What I would like there is. Um, I would like something included in that PSPO and in policy to say that um, the maximum of nine do uh, six dogs should not be an absolute offence. There must be evidence connected with those six dogs that there is a lack of control. Um, so there has to be, and I know I'm not trying to fudge the issue here, because you could have six chihuahuas. I don't know how violent chihuahuas are but they're pretty small dogs, and whether there is an issue of control or not. Now, this number six comes from um, the, uh, if you look at uh, page 26 on here, uh, comes from the uh, RSPCA and the Kennel Club. So they suggest the maximum number of, of six dogs. Uh, page my page 27. Sorry, page, sorry, page 27, yeah. So, yeah, 26 is the, 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 the number. So, the, so there is public support for this. And but the issue is, do we set a number or do we not? The good thing about setting a number is that uh, we have a benchmark there. And that benchmark, I think, uh, is right, that if you've got six Alsatian dogs and they're out of control, that is probably unacceptable and should be dealt with. There is other legislation to deal with out of control dogs full stop, but we need to encourage individuals that, you know, if you can't control six dogs, uh, there is a number there, there's some, a benchmark to go by, uh, and if it's associated then with evidence of lack of control, then we should go on. Now, I don't know whether that fudges it too much, but if we could have to include a maximum of six dogs, uh, um, but also must be evidence by a lack of control of those six dogs. If you look at the table page 26, Casual, on question 10, yeah. it's three, four, five, six dogs, that's people 100% responses. What's that the numbers they were given as options? What did people say? Because there are some professional dog walkers, aren't there, who actually mm -hmm. take a large number of dogs out. But I just wonder where the figure six is. You've got you know, 73% saying up to four dogs. Yeah. I just wonder how you, why you arrived at six dogs. Well, six dogs was as a result of the uh, broad advice and suggestions okay. from the RSPCA and the dogs. So, so I, think, I think it is subjective. I think it's absolutely subjective. And I think their opinion. I'm not an expert dog lover mm -hmm. or a dog walker. All right, what, what I do want is to try and ensure that we have safer communities. Got that. And this is one issue. So it's open for debate, and I think we can hopefully cut some. Let's go back at the end, Richard. Thank, Thank you so much. Councillor Yeah, I was just going to say, we, what happens if you've got two dogs in there under control? And, and you know, failure to keep your dog under control. Should, should you just be um, something to enforce right in the beginning? Failure to keep yeah. your dog under control. It doesn't matter if you've got one dog or two dogs. Uh, that that is what maybe we kind of have sort of wraps a lot of that up. Yeah. Really, but um, six dogs. If you're likely to have six, well, I don't really know anybody has got six dogs. But if you're likely to have six dogs or more, you're probably working for one of the dog walking um, companies that are very skilled in dog handling. Um, the normal Joe blogs are very much. Dog. Well, I've never seen anybody apart from a dog handler like that walk six dogs. So. I wouldn't even see it. I wouldn't even want a number. I'd just put failure to keep your dog under, or dog slash dogs under control. Okay. And you come back at that point, thank you. I'm sure Richard would consider that. Uh, Councillor Wesley. Thank you. 
similar comment to Councillor Randall there. Um, you know, this is people's livings we're talking about here as well. There's a lot of people actually look after other people's dogs and, um, and make a living out of it. And obviously people rely on that service as well. So, you know, that's either going to go up in price or, or not be done. That's the, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, this doesn't even say how many people are involved in this. I'm not, people take dogs out for, people take their dogs out in groups. If you see three or four people walking with, with eight dogs. Does that count? I mean, we talk. This is really loose. Oh, so this really is per person. Yeah. That's what we're pointing at. So yeah, I mean, this is really loose and woolly. I mean, I don't. You know, I think you know, dogs out. One dog out of control is a dog out of control. Six dogs slightly out of control is not the same thing. I mean, I think that we. I don't know what we're. I don't know what we're talking about here. Really. We'll come back to that point again, last. It's a fair. It's a fair point. Councillor Chanter. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, most of my point has just been made. I wanted clarification whether we're talking here about under the control of a single person, and also what happens if a, a group of people, each with one dog, are walking them together. Um, does that is that covered? So yeah. Yeah. it's not there, clear yeah. because yeah. it's not stated. Thank you. Come back there. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Chair. Pleasure. Um, it, uh, it was Go back, please, to <coughs> the exclusion of dogs from locked or maintained, maintained sports pitches in season. I just wanted clarification, please, on this. It's, it's not going to be um, uh, put in, but is this, this is something which comes up time and time again in villages, um, dogs fouling on the sports fields. And I just wondered, how is that going to be, I mean, is it going to be still up to the parish councils to decide that they can exclude um, dogs from their sports pitches? Thank you, Karen, that's, that's what we've noted. We'll come back in a minute. Any more questions before we go back to Councillor Orga? And support by Maria. Councillor Orga. Yeah, could, uh, Maria, could you deal with the technical side on, and then I'd like to sort of sum up on, on a couple of issues about this, because it's quite an interesting debate, and, um, yeah. yeah. Um, if anybody's got any dog, one or two or six, and that dog is out of control. Yeah. We, the uh, local authority officers, have the powers in legislation to deal with that anyway. What this is about is whether there's the political choice available to you, given the consultation we've done, whether you actually want to set up a limit. When I say set up a limit, that would always only ever be policed, enforced reasonably. So if we suddenly had an event where there was 12 huskies pulling along <laughs> something, we're not, we're not about to send a dog warning out to issue some sort of fixed kind of notice. It's, um, as suggested by um, the RSPCA and the Kennel Club, setting that maximum so that there's a bar um, and see how that goes. It's, it's but, is, that, is that one time per person? Yeah, that's six dogs per person. So if there were several people walking, um, you know, a couple of dogs each, that wouldn't automatically catch them. But if, if you've got several people with dogs that they haven't got good control of, we already have power to enforce them. And I think that goes on with uh, Councillor Randall's point. You know, there is legislation to cover this. This is about trying to educate and to give some advice and some and a yardstick to the public as to what we feel it has public support. You know, it has support from professional people like the RSPCA, the Dog Kennel and Defra. So there is some people who know what they're talking about, saying actually this is quite a good idea. Um, the good thing about this, we can always relook at it. Um, it's always open to. Um, it might well be something that actually adds to uh, the protection and the improvement of our public spaces, especially with regard to uh, the uh, dog issue. So, you know, I'm still, even with the debate, the debate still have a mind to uh, put this through. It's red. Um, it's but, yeah, it's red. Uh, but I do feel, with regard to the assurances we have, that we need obviously evidence to uh, support uh, the out of control. Um, uh, for me, is that safeguard to making sure that you know we've got the six to hour situation, which is a major problem. But uh, so I would, I'm still convinced that we should go as uh, recommended. So, uh, strategy group, do you support that uh, proposal? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, can we vote on that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 Those against? 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 Those
that's the name. Uh, thank you. Uh, next one is that's interesting one. Next one. It says uh, the prohibition of smoking. Is that not the one? It's not. It's not clear about the dogs. No, that's that's right. Right. That's, I thought it was about dogs. That's why I asked the question. Yeah. Although that's a good idea. If any dogs are found smoking, I should think we'll probably include those as well. Um, <laughs> I would. I would really hope. Um, that, uh, I, do I really need to debate this with regard to the prohibition of smoking uh, from, from defined public players for, with regard to kids? Um, uh, we have um, situations where we need to help protect, um, uh, our young, in fact, everyone from secondary smoking. I don't really think a mum and the kids going out want to be exposed to smoke. And you could say they're in the open space, but, but, but wait a minute, I've been next to someone smoking. And also have you the detritus associated with smoking with regard to butts, etc., etc., etc. So um, okay. I would think, I think we should go along with uh, with this particular element of the uh, the order. Councillor Wesley? Yeah, it's a difficult one, really. I mean, obviously people can just step outside the fence and smoke the other side of it, so it's a little different stuff. I'll take on board what Councillor Orgel said on the previous ones. It sets a, it sets a sort of a goal and a, and a, a piece of education on that. The only thing I would add to that is vaping, really. Um, what, do we, what do we think about that? And how are we going to understand what's going on? Really? I'm about to ask one to vaping. Thank you, Councillor Wesley. Councillor Morgan? Thank you, Chair. I would say this one almost doesn't require any debate, and it's, it feels so obvious. But uh, I'll actually agree with Councillor Wesley's sanction points there, and also the point about the definition of uh, defined children's play areas. I think also perhaps, uh, I don't know if you mentioned schools as well, or entrances apply to that as well. And uh, quite frankly, I think longer term, I'd rather see uh, mobile devices perhaps in the schools as well. <laughs> I spend over the debate, Councillor Morgan. Yeah. Actually, talk to our children rather than look at their phones. Yeah. I'm sure you do that in your channel. I do, actually. Councillor Chalter. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I support this, but I wanted to add that it's not just the secondary smoking and the detritus, it's the role model that the children mm, yeah, are yeah. Good. That's a good point. Yes. Good point. Some real technical points? Yeah, I'll clarify that a, def a defined area, we've got defined areas where dogs aren't allowed. So it's not every play area, it's where you've got those. Um, literally fenced off with gates, and they're defined, and signs are up. So it won't be any surprise to anybody, there'll be a sign at every entrance and exit to say, at the moment they say, no dogs in here, and now, now we can add, no dogs, no smoking. So, so in those specific areas. Okay, you want to go back to Councillor Wesley? I'm just asking about vaping, really. I've got a few months of vaping. Does vaping include the tackle? No, it's, the recommendation is all smoking. So vaping's okay. Um, I think on the basis with, with the way public health is going at the moment, um, there is not any empirical evidence to suggest vaping is bad. Um, in fact, there's a lot of public health debate around people moving to vape, vaping as a means of stopping smoking. So I don't think, as an, I wouldn't as an officer be recommending that we include some sort of ban vaping. And in any case, we haven't consulted about that. But I think yeah. we would technically be outside of our <coughs> and we to consultation again. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that's a sorry. Do you want to add on first? And then, oh, sorry, I didn't write this. Yeah, I just want to say I support this. Um, quite frankly, uh, when we look at our play areas, there are some play areas that aren't completely fenced off, and that's what I wanted to come to. That if we're going to do it, we've got to make sure that this is well disclosed so that people are aware. And because if it's not, then people will use it and then. That's, that's the problem. So I think this is something we should support because uh, we have to look after our health and particularly the health of our younger people and we need to encourage them to use the play areas. And I'm sure that if there is a, a parent who is uh, completely addicted to smoke, they can step outside but still keep an eye on their children. So Thank that's where I come from on that. I saw the God's very strong response this morning. Yeah, again, all, all of these have public support, you know, and this is where, and then we need to debate to ensure that we've uh, crossed all the, the, the T's and dotted all the I's and the other way around. And vaping is a good point. This is not about vaping, this is about cigarette smoke. And, and maybe in future, when further data comes out with regard to whether it harms or it doesn't harm, we can relook at it. These are the wonderful things about these orders is that we could be adapt to uh, uh, the, the data that comes out with regard to health issues and, and other type of issues. So I recommend we go with, um, with the, the, the band. Do you support this one? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, all agree, thank you. Okay. Uh, DNA, next one. Okay, all right. Explain <laughs> qualified institutions. Okay, page 30. Page 30, that, that's the sort of, right. Uh, first of all, uh, and I'm glad Councillor uh, Adam Brown isn't here. <laughs> because, it's in Brazil, actually. Yeah, well, well yeah. I, just as well, really, because I think he would have. He, he's, 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 the councillor, just to let you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, this is about um, public support, and this this does does not have public support. But let me just let me just uh, rationalise why officers put it in and why um, I can understand that, and then I'll give you my uh, guidance as to where I think we should go on this. Um, it, is, it is good to have a number of tactical options in your back pocket with regard to if uh, there is a particularly intractable problem of dog pooing. I can't believe how I just talked about these issues, but and everything else has failed, uh, then you still have that sort of ultimate tactic to bring in. Same that. So I can understand the rationale of the officers. And for me, from an enforcement point of view, it, it's always wise to have those contingencies. But two issues here. One, I don't think it has a political, a, a, a public support, and uh, therefore I would be recommended that we simply do not include it in this PSPO uh, going round. Um, and then maybe in the future, uh, we can certainly uh, develop that idea. Certainly the amount of emails I get about creating these DNA databases from uh, companies, uh, it might stop that, uh, that sort of uh, uh, communication transfer, but, um, but I think in these on reflection, and having uh, talked it through with, um, with, with Maria, uh, I'm of opinion that we should not include this, uh, rather than have it as a qualified inclusion. So that's going to be say not included, not, not included. included. Not, that's a change, thank you. Got three speakers like that, Councillor Wesley. I know some rather pleased that Councillor Orbe said that because I think it was a bit of a dark idea and uh, <laughs> I think it's not the right decision. Thank you, Councillor Wesley. Councillor Orbe? Exactly the same. Thank you. Councillor Gilbert. I agree and um, support the not inclusion of this, not but inclusion, yeah. I want to just point out two other things in uh, argument for not supporting it. Totally agree on the public uh, do not support it and we should be listening to our public. Two, we had, uh, you quoted earlier about the restriction of number of dogs, number to six, recommended by the Kenilworth Club. Well, the Kenilworth Club and the RSPCA also strongly um, do not support the inclusion of this. So that is another argument in the sense to not inclusion. And the third one is um, one that we're almost penalising good behaviour as well in doing this, in that. Um, there's those dog walkers uh, that are responsible and walk their dogs. Um, but if an area here becomes more prolific to dog pooing by the irresponsible dog owners, then the responsible dog owners will suffer as well. So those are my three arguments for dog pooing. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. I would just say, Chairman, to clarify, um, by saying qualified inclusion, what what I was envisaging was that we include something in the PSPO that says where you have got a very significant intractable problem, by having it in your orders, you could have a promotional period where you can say, please help us keep this area clean, pick up after your dogs, because if you don't, we could bring in uh, measures, either DNA testing or dogs on leads or both. So I just wanted to clarify that was what was envisaged. So setting out that there's a yes to this, a no to this, and a maybe. Thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It covers all options. I so have very, very loudly what's been said. Yes. I'm, I'm slightly concerned about that argument. Supposing you have an area where there is a bad problem. Now, that bad problem will be caused by irresponsible dog owners. Well, okay, we just agreed not to do that, I think. That's what we just said. But it's the qualified if it was a good one. That's okay, yeah. What we're actually doing here, we're going to yeah. say yeah. Council August proposed not to be included. Yeah. Yeah. So can you go to the vote on that? Everyone included? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So that's yeah. not yeah. to be included. Yeah. It's not speaking. Yeah. We've got one more council order. Do you want to talk to that? So I'm just going to say not to be included. Go get the not to be included. Uh, no. It's just not to be included. No, that's right. Unless anyone particularly wants to debate it, this is where there isn't public support. No, that's right. And, and I think the whole purpose of the consultation was to look to what the public wanted 
and rather than us imposing top yeah. down. Very good. So do we agree the recommendation, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we move on to the second one, sir. Proposed voluntary right to buy futures housing. Yeah, I feel, I feel a little bit like um, uh, Councillor Chandler uh, with regard to so many reports. Normally, I, I, I might get one, I'm not even looking on the case. We're not, we're not the same as Councillor Chandler. It's all between our own here. Okay, um, this, this really is, uh, uh, we, we met and discussed this uh, with uh, officers um, and, uh, and, and looked through. Uh, Mr. Bowers and look through actually how how to deal with this. So basically, what we have is uh, the government uh, made a commitment to extend a right to buy, and this is about people that are in uh, tenants of registered providers and affordable houses, and allowing the eligible household the right to buy at levels of discount. Uh, this has now been gradually implemented through a voluntary rather than a statutory approach. Hence, the voluntary the VRT, the voluntary right to buy. Now, I certainly believe uh, that everybody who, who is in uh, rented accommodation, wherever they may be, uh, uh, should have an opportunity to as aspire to buy their own home if possible. So I actually understand uh, where this is coming from and I, I would encourage this type of policy. However, future housings who wish to be part of this pilot, it's, it lasts for about two years, or the last for two years, considers that there is a clawback clause because we sold on stock, and I'm sure Mr. Bowers will um, correct me if I'm wrong, we sold on stock uh, to futures, that, uh, that, there, that, that there was a clawback with regard to if they sold them at a later date. As long as I keep getting nods, I'll carry on. So this means typically that the council would receive about half of the sales value around, on most recent available data, £45,000 per property. A lot of money. A lot of money. Okay. So of course, um, futures are saying, okay, if we give you that £43,000, part of this policy is also, if we look at it, is that the scheme envisages, envisages a one-for-one -one replacement of affordable housing so that we don't actually lose the amount of affordable housings we want. We can't go back to the old days when we sell everything and we haven't got anything for people who need to have affordable housing. So the idea is to sell it on, sell it to the people who want to buy it. We don't envisage it to be a lot of people. And then um, the money's then to be to replace that house, that particular house. So whatever their other targets are, all right, that is different to replacing that particular house. And what Futures are saying is, look, we'd love to be part of this, but you take 43 grand off us, and we're going to have to struggle with that. So if you look at page 39, there is some um, a, a basic proposal and agreements to allow Futures, all right, to keep all those monies. Now, if we think about that as a, a principle, um, uh, this is not a profit-making company with regard to shareholders. Uh, this is a company whose sole purpose is to provide affordable housing, <coughs> all right, and then with any profits they make, plowing it back to building more affordable housing. So we're not actually lining anyone's pockets here. And then we would uh, insist that, that those receipts, that 43 grand, are ring-fenced to fund uh, specifically for providing replacements for those houses. This is a two-year project. Uh, the concerns I, that we spoke through is that we do not want to tie the hands of the council beyond the two-year pilot, because there may be, in the future, a reason why we need those <coughs> to that £43,000, because the landscape may change. So what we suggested is to allow the pilot project to, 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 to begin, to see what sort of demand, to try and allow people the opportunity to buy their own house, to make sure those houses are replaced. We will forego that for a period of two years. There are some conditions to it, and if you look through page 39, one to six, that actually lays the whole scheme down. Um, this would be an opportunity uh, for us to uh, progress with the pilot. So I recommend that we uh, allow this foregoing of uh, the callback for a period of two years whilst the pilot is in existence uh, with those conditions to ensure the monies are spent to replace the houses uh, that are lost um, and, and uh, see what happens after two years.
Let's go so forward. That, I think basically, I think all of us did. Just what's meaning? Can we? Does that is that make I any sense? I do because um, I've got it wrong. Described as not quite right. Okay, right. Well, <laughs> then. So what's the right answer? As I understand it, um, for those tenants who were tenants at the time <coughs> of the um, transfer, transfer yeah. who have the right to buy um, now, that if they choose to buy their house, we will still <coughs> receive the income that we are due. But if the tenancy has changed, yeah. and it's a housing association tenant who yeah. lives in one of our houses, this voluntary right to buy would now apply to them. And the idea that we won't lose out is that because the chances of them buying that house are reduced under their current housing association discount, but that we still will receive any monies that are sold to uh, tenants who were our tenants at the time. So where we have a budget for our right to buy receipts, that will be maintained. But if it's sold to a tenant who, who's changed over time and is now a housing association tenant, this proposal is about <coughs> them having the same right to buy discounts as old tenants, if you like. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that um, because their discount will be increased, there's, there's a higher likelihood that they will buy it. We're not actually losing any money because without that discount, they wouldn't have bought it. So we maintain our right to buy receipts, but it also means that the Housing Association for those changed tenants can keep that receipt and have the funding from, I believe that's right. Chairman, I, I'm confident the Chief Finance Officer is going to summarise that correctly. That is what the report says, and that is what the blue future says. Yes, I think it's also what the portfolio has said yeah, in, in summary form. No, no, he said we would forego the money. Well, we'll only well, forego the money for those people who buy the house as a housing association tenant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. 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 It's it's clear clear the report. It's clear the report. Clearing the report. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So we'll still get some money. Thanks, Order. Councillor Osborne. Okay. The point has just been made that I was going to make. Thank you, Steve. Well, they are. That's the order written by. Uh, Councillor Randall. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I just wondered that how would this money be used to build a house like for like? Is you know, with, if it's got um, a large discount, is that enough money to build a house like for like? And where would they be placed? Would they be? Um, would you then negotiate with the developer to say we've got, you know, that they've got this money, and can they build additional <coughs> houses that will be housing association on top of the percentage that's already been awarded? Is that how it would work? Chairman, dealing with the discount point first, the nature of this scheme is the housing associations that take part have to offer the full discount that would be applicable to statutory right to buy in, in our area up to £80,000 to £90,000 per property. The government then reimburses the housing association for that discount. So the housing association has got full value to do the best work. Uh, that's why it's limited to 6000 across the middle, there's only so much money in the government's budget and so they want to make sure that they don't run out of money um, during the pilot. Um, in terms of how the replacement will be managed, Futures has a house building programme, and building the replacements will be part of that. They will look for sites in the district in the first instance. It could be they will buy houses from developers in, in addition to the Section 106 requirements. It could be they'll develop small sites themselves. Um, and if they can't get them from the district sensibly, then they've got this 10 mile perimeter within which they can operate. Thank you, Simon. Okay, Wendy. Thank you. Um, Council, sorry, my apologies. It's Council Guildford. Okay, um, my question is around um, the actual replacement. Um, because we talk about if they don't do the replacement, then the money has become payable to the Council. Um, but I'd like it absolutely um, tight that they have to build that replacement lost because that's why they're getting the grant under the uh, scheme from the government for monies. Yes, if they don't build it, then it will, the monies will come forward. But um, if we look at page uh, 39 and the 3, and it 
it might be I don't understand legal terminology, but it says reasonable endeavours duty. So to me, reasonable endeavours is not the same as, it almost contradicts earlier, where it says they will have to. I get the point, I get the point. Get I mean, the it's point. obviously about making sure we replace the stock. That's the that, yeah. Yeah. Chairman, perfectly fair questions. The, it's quite a delicate construction of the agreement. The, the primary obligation is to provide replacement like the like. However, it can't be an absolute obligation because there may be factors that prevent them. Uh, if they just cannot proclaim power, for example, for some kind of monitorial on house bills, there's all kinds of things that could happen that could make it impossible. So, the obligation, the basic obligation of the is a pretty tough obligation, but not absolute. Then, then there is a slightly softer obligation to do it within three years and to do it within the district. So, it's a sort of scale of obligations. The provision for paying the money to the council is very much a fallback mm. if for some reason they were unable to achieve what it is they need to do and what it is they want to do in the fairness. You would assess whether reasonable endeavours are taking place. Absolutely. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for allowing me, Chair. Um, my concern is my understanding is that the replacement house, the houses could be built outside the district, a 10 mile, 10 mile boundary. Um, you know, that includes parts of Northampton, a lot of Northampton, it includes rugby and so on. And that, Mark, you know, one could go on around the south and that it I don't know if it reaches Spanbury or not. But my point is that, you know, that if this is to happen, what it would mean over time is that the number of affordable homes in the district is going to be down. And the number of new homes that we build, you know, okay, you know, there are perhaps there are more homeless people in, in Northampton than there are in parts of that the district. I fully accept that. But over time, um, it could be that this, you know, this district will have many fewer affordable homes. Um, houses are provided elsewhere. We can't assume that people who you know, are homeless, say, here in Daventry Town, would be quite happy accepting a home in Northampton. Some might, but I think we've got to assume that we, you know, that we are always within, you know, within the district, and particularly in, you know, within Daventry Town, where you have a greater you know, a greater proportion of the you know, of, 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 of social housing. Um, you know, the needs are going to be greater, but we, I, I'm just concerned about what the long-term effect could be on our um, housing stock. Perhaps we need thinking long-term any longer, um, and it is a two-year pilot, I accept. But it just seems strange as to why that particular that particular clauses there allowing the homes to be outside the district. Chairman, the reason that's there fundamentally is futures were concerned the risk of the obligation was too high if they were entirely constrained to work within the district. If they can't get the land, they can't get the deal, they can't get the planning permission, then they could be in a situation where they have an obligation to government to be provided and government for the sale, but they were unable to comply with an obligation to us to within the district. So the 10 mile buffer, which is only the you know, second choice in any event, is there as a risk management measure for them. It was a necessary part of the negotiation for them to accept um, the overall package. Um, so it's not desirable, and if we can, we will certainly support them to get all the houses back in the district. The other thing I would say is we've got nomination rights in all cases. The district is well over 20 miles across, so actually being, say, in Market Harbour, is arguably no worse than being in Clipston in Daphne or wherever. So, yes, perfectly valid points, but I think we've got to strike the right balance in terms of different considerations. Thank you, Simon. Back to you, Councillor. Yeah, just, just a couple of points, and I'll I, I pick up on that point. For, for, for me, the overall scheme is the replacement of the house. Now, wherever that happens to be, I don't think the public necessarily worry about whether an affordable house is actually in our district or just five miles across the border in another. In, a, in another district or another another jurisdiction, I think it's important just to have the, the stock there, have the stock there. So, so I'm not too worried about that that particular clause. It's about ensuring that we don't lose the sort of total number. And just with regard to the point from Audrey, you know, this is, from what I understand, is the VRT. This is all to do with the voluntary. <coughs> I think talked about the voluntary, 
Now, the voluntary one is where we are foregoing the clawback, <coughs> only the voluntary scheme. Are you saying there's part of this voluntary scheme that is not subject to clawback? Because there's other schemes that, 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 that it says in the report that isn't part of it. This is specifically to do with futures wanting to do the, the, the voluntary bit um, with regard to ensuring they get those monies to buy the next one. So the, the stack, they could sell, you know, one of our homes. And yeah. Like I say, if that was... To well, under this scheme. Yes, they could sell one of the houses currently. And, it, and if the tenant... Was um, was allowed the statutory right to buy. Yeah. We would still get our yeah. floor back. But that's not the voluntary scheme, is it? That the, we're the, about? the voluntary scheme is applied to the housing association right. tenant. They're all tenants of housing yeah. association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But new ones that were never are. Right. Tenants. Okay. So but it's only the voluntary ones that it's affected. It doesn't. It, it doesn't impact the others. I'm not too sure whether I misspoke and said it affected all. I just saw about the voluntary. This particular scheme. Legal tenants um, from November 20, 2007. Yes. Yeah. Because they don't have. Because if I did, I didn't mean that it was it was all sales. It was just specifically to do with just this one. Knowledge. Yeah. So if yeah. I, I, I if I misspoke, I apologise. But I didn't. <laughs> don't, don't worry, I okay. All right. Yeah. So so there, there's there's a report for you. Since we've actually still coming. Oh, sorry. So you can ask the guilty first. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my understanding here of the report is the risk is with the house association, not. In that um, the um, grant that they're applying for would be applied to the housing association. Yes, we have this separate agreement with them on the right to buy, but I'm presuming any people they have in their housing um, uh, stock who are the original and want to buy, although they still qualify for the. Um, New voluntary one, but just counts. They wouldn't qualify for the new one. They're not. Sorry, chair. The one boy is busy. Through you, chair. Housing association tenants. Let's just say new tenants since 2007 yeah. have a right to acquire, yeah. Yeah. and it's a lesser discount. Now, if they sold one of the houses under that, we'd still be able to yeah. claw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there is. There is yeah. What we're saying is because the discount is so much smaller, it's less likelihood that that house will sell. So although we'd be entitled to that money, we're not really losing out because the chances are we wouldn't have sold it anyway. So we are foregoing income, but it's, it was unlikely income. Um, and now that if they have the voluntary right to buy and the discount that they get is increased in line with the statutory right to buy, more likelihood they'll buy the house, and it's that income that we are then foregoing. Yeah, yeah that's how I understood it. Small risk. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Councillor Howard? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I should say when, because you have to. Go ahead. I've got quite a few concerns with the wording of this document. Um, things that concern me on 4.4, there is a note there, second paragraph, uh, saying there would be a risk that if affordable housing was sold, it might not be replaced. That concerns me. Replacement yeah. might not benefit residents of this district. That concerns me. As for the 10 miles out of the boundary, well, people in Daventry or the, or the district of Daventry want to stay with their family in within the district. They don't want to travel whether it's five miles outside of going towards any other uh, boundary. They, they wouldn't want to do that. They want to be in the family. Use of the use reasonable endeavours. I'm sorry, Simon, but that still worries me because in two years' time, what happens after two years' time? I know it's only a two year pilot, but this will go on after that event. Uh, and then on 5.1 on the financial, which really concerns me, it says there is a possibility that uh, an eventual outcome may be that homeless costs, homelessness costs increase as affordable housing stock is specifically social rent properties will be depleted and more people compete for a limited number of properties. So it worries me a little bit that we're not going to have stock for our families and now our children's children in the future, because if we're not going to have houses built for them by this company, where do we go then? I'm going to come back and identify some risks. Councillor Osborne? Um, on, on that point, that's been happening for years. Even when the council had the houses, when you were selling houses, the stock is getting less and less. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so it, it's, it's not going to get any worse. It, it's, it, it's been happening for years. 
and plus to that, if, if houses are sold outside, when it becomes available to every district or every unit treaty to have the same system, it'll mean everybody joining us will have the same problem. Yeah, if, if they can't put it in their bit, now we're putting it in our bit. So it'll work out it'll work out that we'll get just as many houses come in, possibly, as going out. Yeah. Um, because of the funding side of it. So I, I don't see any harm in it. That's that's what's well uh sounds like just kind of bit where it's I can do so. I mean I think I'll first say the report seeks to be fair and balanced to reflect the risks mm -hmm. and the opportunities. Um, and so I guess there are risks and they're acknowledged. Uh, what we have set out on page 39 is a set of measures that are designed to minimise those risks whilst enabling the council to enable the voluntary right to buy a function. I think we've gone about as far as we can in tying futures down while still having them set the risks that are acceptable to the point they can take part in the pilot. So yes, there are some potential negatives, that's absolutely right. Um, it's a question to the council whether it values in enabling the pilot sufficiently to take those risks. Thank you. Now we've got the recommendation for to catch order. Yeah, yeah, that, that, just, that was just on my point. And this is what it's all about. It's giving people the opportunity. Of course there are risks. It's yes. giving the opportunity they want to buy their own. Thank you. I have to support the recommendation. Great. Great. Anyone against? One against. Thank you. Any abstentions? No? Thank you. That's been approved, that recommendation. The last one, Councillor. Yeah, thank Thank you. Uh, uh, Governing Act 2005, stems to licensing policy. Okay. Three years. <coughs> okay. Every three years, the Gambling Act 2005 requires licensing authority to review and publish a statement of principles that they intend to apply when exercising their related functions. As you will see, that this proposal is that a wide-scale consultation exercise take place for a six-week period, starting at week beginning the 24th of September this year. The consultation process will lead to the development of a final draft, which will be tabled at strategy group between the 15th of November, sorry, on the 15th of November. The final policy will then be considered at full council on the 6th of December. There's specifically a little bit about the no casino resolution, which is uh, going out again for consultation. Um, so it gives an opportunity just to consult, see where we are, and then review again on the 15th of November. Thank you. Very interesting on the casino ones. Obviously, we're going to be a year three, don't we? Casinos in the year Yeah. So that's very interesting how that's going to pan out across the whole industry area. Yeah. Anyway, I just want that. Is there any uh, comments or questions? I'm due to the chair. Two more I can pick on. Um, not that good now. Um, well, <laughs> well, I, do, I, I, I do go to one of them. I've told you before, yeah. but there aren't two in Northampton, so when we become a unitary, there will be two casinos in their area. Do we come in to do it? And when the new one has got to be Wolf Tax Place, there will be three. That's what you're looking at, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was my belief that um, PSPOs, um, they're about an area. Mm -hmm. and when uh, the local authority boundaries, if and when they change, that will carry forward with its existing lifespan into the new authority area. So unless the shadow authority goes to some great lengths to get a new policy, the individual policies for Devonshire, South and Hampton, I believe will continue. Until their time, right? Yeah. yeah. That's fine. Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. do you set the result down? This is a result down, it's not a recommendation, by the way. Everyone have to set the result down? Yeah, Any again? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Orton. The last one was the easiest one, eh? Human resources issues. Now, people workforce development strategies, corporate workforce development plan. Councillor Griffin. Um, thank you, Councillor. As members will have expected, there's been some forward thinking here in response to the possible transformation of service delivery. Um, the strategy provides HR policy and direction to ensure people management practice to support the delivery of the corporate strategic plan and to assist our employees preparing for the future provision of labor services and the uncertain future. As always, recruitment and retention are very high on the agenda, but we have achieved silver accreditation in investors and people further work as noted in power four one. The four key themes, valuing our people, developing, transforming and preparing for change, drives positive preparation. 
the corporate workforce development plan is attached, and that implements the strategy, but will also be revisited as decisions come forward from the local government review. The strategy aims to support all of our employees, as mentioned in 5.9. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nikas. Uh, so on page 77, develop and launch the recruitment. It's just Microsoft. What's what's it? Microsoft. Sort of it's yes, it's a it's a recruitment website. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, structures, pay structures, well, yes, yes, yes. Um, and I argued that we couldn't get planning officers. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that my name's in the plans, but we have a new officer coming directly as a result of the, of the pay structure being altered, and he's coming from a local, from, from Ruby, which has so, so it's starting to work even in my little bit, I can see it. Well done. I know That's it's good. not. No, it's, 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 it's a good indication, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's working anyway. Thank you, President. We have two recommendations before you. Happy to agree them? Agree. Agree yes. against? No, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Move on to court issues now. You see Councillor Lenny's development on page 95 uh, of your papers. Um, basically, there's three recommendations there. I'll leave them out to you that progress on council development be noted. Like all councillors should attend. Um, the plan programs and finance, we think that's one of the things we do every year. Uh, Asterisk on the learning development plan for 1819, as recommended by the member learning development group. And uh, the member and learning development plan for 2018 is endorsed. I have to put forward Councillor Irving Swift's appointment, by the way, I forgot to mention that earlier. She should have dealt with those items, wouldn't that? So she put a point to learning. So you've got three items before you, happy to open up for any questions. Yes, sir. Just the one in that um, with everything that's going on externally, yeah. and, and I noticed the word that all councillors should attend the planning programme. Well, any important training that you know I consider that the staff should have, I make it mandatory. And I know that we've always um, shied away from making any training mandatory. But in these unprecedented times. <laughs> Planning, she's talking about, Jane. No, I'm not. No. She's talking about finance. Through the chair, please. Thank you. That um, maybe we should be look at having mandatory attendance at the training with regards to finance. Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. no, I'm not going to agree to that, Joan. Um, I've only got a couple of years left anyway. I've been around here 32 years. Um, um, I've been to tons of training, tons of committees, learned the committee system, um, and, and I catch up what's going on. And in the next two years, I don't intend to do a lot more training. So I don't, but I, I think it's a good idea for people that don't have that experience to, to endure the training and to get that experience. Thank you. That's good. I, I, I thought, uh, I'm not saying mandatory for all training, I'm talking about in these unprecedented times. There are well, areas, well, areas that are going to impact on the staff significantly, that maybe we should have mandatory training. Okay, I'll come back to you with this. Um, we've got some speakers that come back to you. Is that okay? Come on, come on to that. I'll be point. very quick. What yeah. are you going to do to them if they don't come? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? I know what this would be. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. Yeah, I, 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 I always have an issue with mandatory training. Yeah. You know, it, it is about your own professional integrity and, 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 and trying to keep abreast of what's going on. I, I think if we're really genuinely seriously about what we're trying to do so that the public understand how governance works, then we should be uh, eager to learn. That doesn't mean we have to attend every training because um, some training is repetitive, but it does mean that uh, we, we need to make sure we're fit for purpose. So that should be a personal thing. And if, Councillor Morgan, thank you, Chair. My point was really already raised about how you enforce it. What would be the penalty for non-attendance? Thank you, Taser. Thank you.
Professor Richard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suspect that we all have the same problem of our inboxes getting filled up with people wanting to sell exceptionally expensive courses. Um, it is, <laughs> that is it, 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 Yeah, um, whatever it might be, it, 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 it's a big, big industry. Um, nevertheless, it always strikes me that the, that the range of issues being discussed, and maybe there are other councils that, you know, that get involved in these particular debates, um, probably much bigger ones and ones with more um, strategic issues to grapple with than, than, than we might step into district. But it just strikes me that the range of the, you know, of the briefing sessions, I mean, clearly mean briefing sessions, so that we are equipped to do, to take the decisions that are put in front of us, where it strikes me that there is a, you know, you know there is possibly a, you know, a lack of, you know, of feeding and information. It's on some of these wider issues about local government, what is actually happening within, in other parts of local government. It's about the areas in which, um, you know, there is space for councils thinking afresh about things. It perhaps is rather late in its life um, to start thinking afresh with here within Daventry. But you know, thinking ahead, it strikes me that some of these, some of these issues um, ought to be of interest to us as we move into new times. And whether there are ways in which we can have the discussions here at the Stavanger District Council without paying hundreds of pounds per person to go and listen to people tell them, sometimes not very much. Having spoken at many of these courses in the past, I'm aware of how all the information they get can be. Okay, well, the point you make is a fair point, I think. Well, I was, I mean, you have the e learning modules here, of course, which, uh, you know, so you can't get to the training sessions, you can do it online. But I think, come back to you, this, the sum up, sorry, Catherine. Well, you just said it, yeah. actually, yeah. because I was going to draw their attention to 4.4 yeah. and the e learning modules. <coughs> um, also, um, if anybody's got requests for extra training, yeah. Yeah. Um, please let Fabienne know. Fabienne, she's she's yeah, yeah, the yeah. chairman yeah. of that group. Um, but also, we have a lot of in-house training with our own officers, yes. and that's a wonderful opportunity. Not only doesn't it cost anything extra, it does mean that members have a chance to um, discuss with the officer and get to know the officer, which is also very helpful. Yes. So you sort of get double double benefit there. Good advice, Liz. I just say, uh, I think it's up to, as uh, Rich Organ sort of indicated by not having mandatory, it's up to members themselves to identify their own training needs and take their own proactive action to actually get themselves some courses or to do the e-learning whatever they think is appropriate. So we all have a responsibility in that area. So on that basis, I'll be happy to accept the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the next one, which will take the risk register, which gives me a slight opportunity actually on this one to actually talk about the latest on the unity because actually look at the risk register itself. Um, uh, one point is what I think it's not even part of the number here. It's uh, number three. It's actually between two and three. It's unmarked. It's new. Okay, there's a new one put in there, it's unmarked. It will be number three, I guess, when it's uh, updated. Thank you, Joe. Uh, about the prospect of even the local government reform in Northamptonshire. And actually, I think local government reform is an interesting word. It can be more than that. It's public sector reform. It's been really quite lovely. To, to, to take things forward, but I realise we can't do everything at once necessarily. Uh, yesterday, um, we had a meeting with the MPs in London yesterday evening, which was quite an interesting affair. Uh, I can't go into all the details, but what we wanted the MPs to realise was our concerns about the, the need for government to help support us, uh, you know, that kind of sense of the, where it would come from. We had to be aware, we updated on from our perspective what's been going on with uh, Mr. Roussel, the Chief Sultan, and the Minister and the fact that we're now looking at um, uh, asking, um, we're, saying to the, we're saying to the government basically, we need some help here to make it work, because obviously putting eight councils into two and learning is going to solve it, we made that very clear in our bid. And uh, I think they were fairly reasonable, okay, but they, they, I think also they're starting to realise now the scale of the challenge. And that's no bad thing for the government uh, MPs to realise that. 
Uh, one of the things I think has been quite helpful, um, I raised it last night about the need for public transformation. I went to the Health and Wellbeing Board this morning, which is uh, uh, over at East North Hants, and uh, we have all the key strategic health partners there, and they're very quick, keen to engage in the discussion. So I've arranged for all the main players, there's about five of them, including the voluntary sector, to come along to our next leadership exec um, meeting on the 26th of September when Corby back in the camp then. Because Corby up to now have been excluded since they voted against the bid, they're now going to come back in on the 26th of September. And that's when we have um, these, uh, the voluntary sector and some of these key chief executives from the health sector to talk about the potential for public transformation. Because there's no point just in the councils alone if we believe the answer is beyond just councils. And therefore the health sector also have a massive financial pressure in Northamptonshire. So it has to be a benefit both ways maybe. In trying to, you know, we're, we're planning the future, it'd be silly not to engage in the process. So all partners on the 26th will be around the table, hopefully, all the least representations from them at a very senior level to, to actually have a chat about this. Because I think it's important. And we can't leave them out there leave for too long. There's no point us planning ahead as local authorities when in fact the health sector also got their issues to resolve and there's going to be more joined up thinking between the joined up connections between the two. And I have to say, I think the health sector actually has got some major challenges in terms of their monies and in terms of the county, I'm talking about the county, maybe nationally actually, but certainly in our county, the two hospital trusts and uh, the CCGs, there's some challenges there. And I think we have to work together, if you agree of course, I'm only representing your views, but I think we all agree that transformation is part of our ask and I shall keep banging the drum on that. But I have to take any questions on any aspects of the strategic risk register before you. It's just really, it's really, as you say, it's a uh, massive thing to understand. That's the newest resource, it's a pretty big one. Uh, but just to sort of revise the rest of them. And so, if you're happy with that, can we yeah. just do that presentation? Great. Great. Thank you. And the last one on this section is annual report on capital entities. And I think you should have just noted these entities, but it's quite helpful. We don't normally consider information reports, but it's helpful to actually consider provided a mechanism for consideration of issues related to these entities which might not otherwise arise. And we're quite keen, I think, with military potentially approaching that we assess um, our assets in this count in this area uh, to see what we may want to do with or not do with them before we get further down the line of the unitary debate. That will come maybe through screening and improvement. I got to speak to Adam Brown, who's on holiday at the moment, and when he gets back, he'll give me a ring on that because there's a, there's a suggestion and from Richard Micklewright, who's running their task panel, that that task panel is now finished, that maybe is something that Srinthi could look at to review our assets and to see uh, what, if anything, members want to consider before we go much further down the route. So for instance, you might want to consider if you want to sell one, or we might want to consider uh, how we want to play it with the unitary. That's going to be taken up by the unitary to the town council or another parish council, take things more to town than parish, because obviously most of the assets we own are in the town. That sort of thing before it goes too far down the line. Other than that, happy to take any questions on the paper before you. No? You happy just to note them? Thank you. Please help me have that information. Thank you. So that's the resolved item, just noted. Thank you. The next item on page 123 is request by Rich for help for new premises. I'm deferring this because there's been a um, uh, request made following the initial presentation of the report, and I just felt wasn't comfortable that all the detail hadn't been really confirmed on, on both sides. So I felt this should be deferred now to the 15th of November meeting, only if you would, only if you were happy to do so. Yeah, I saw something on it, it said uh, an email out that it was it, um, it not in, in what's the word? It seemed like it. Indefinitely, is, is that, that's not the case, surely. Well, I'm putting really forward to know, take it to the 50th Revenge, which is not indefinitely. Do you support that? Yeah, no, no, absolutely, because I think <coughs> we, we, if, we, if, it's, if it's indefinitely, it's just kicking a can down a road, which isn't particularly a long road. No. So we need to uh, get this sorted. So I would definitely want it back on the 15th so we can look at it and, 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 and get this one sorted. Thank you. Councillor Hills? Yeah, um, quite frankly, no, looking at it again, November the 15th. Is a, is a date that we must keep. It's a, it must be a fixed date because, quite frankly, um, it's a very important thing that we're looking at. 
and uh, with the time constraints, yeah. we have just got to move it forward and make sure that it's on the agenda for November the 15th. So as a portfolio holder, and I'm sure you'd be involved in making sure that happens. Yeah. And just keep an eye on how progress is going with the discussions that might take place exactly. for we'll next week. Thank you. Are, there any, are you happy with that group? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Move on to the uh, next item, which is the much more primary school business plan and disposal report. Councillor Hill. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chairman. As stated, this is much more primary school. Um, let's look at the advice and the recommendations. The recommendations are that the council proceed on the basis of the leasehold disposal in 125 years. And I have to state, this is our normal practice in, in cases of this nature. Um, Firstly, I'd like to inform members of the strategy that the school actually opened on the 3rd of September and that it is up and running. So it's the 4th of September report, report that's the also. Yeah. Next, I would refer you to the introduction at the start of the report that gives you an explanation regarding uh, the fact that the council took responsibility for the delivery of the school and this has been achieved. And now the diocese are requesting the school buildings are transferred on a freehold basis. In the background comments of the report, it states that engagement has been entirely positive, except for the issue of the tenure. So currently, if you refer to item 4.3, please note the school is currently operating on a temporary license. And on page 133, it states the diocese would like to make it absolutely clear that the diocese will not accept the lease in its current form. However, having said that, it's worth noting that the four points of their formal objection are in fact all negotiable. And it does not appear that there is anything in these objections that cannot be resolved. Therefore, I firmly believe we should support the officers on this and move forward on a leasehold basis. Thank you. And Councillor Chancellor. Chairman, I think, I hope to declare an interest, I'm a member of the Peterborough Diocese and Synod, but I have no direct dealings with the Board of Education. And so if, if you wish, I'll take no further part in this discussion. That's fine, Chairman. That's thank you, Mr. I suspect all along you were, by the way. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Councillor Wesley. Yeah, I mean, could I just ask, I mean, are we, are we jeopardising the running of this school by entering into, into sort of not, not acquiescing to uh, the requirements of the, uh, the provider? And secondly, what are, we ben what are we actually benefiting from in, uh, in, in giving them a uh, 125 year lease instead of a freehold? So, Chairman, I think the report deals with both those points, but in simple terms, the benefit arises from in the event that at some point the school is closed, patterns of school in change, whatever, the diocese would not be able to sell the site, take the money and use it for something else. Mm -hmm. um, the site would revert to the ownership of the council, which would then use it for the public good uh, in, in this area. And my apologies, Council, I've forgotten the first question. Oh, you've had the school, that was it. Um, no. Uh, the school is open as a matter of statute. Um, it can't be closed now except by formal statutory school closure process. I do not believe the diocese would contemplate the closure of school. Okay, thank you. I think that's, uh, I think that's, that's a very satisfactory answer. answer. Any more questions before we <laughs> go back to Councillor Hills? Okay, Councillor Hills, uh, well, I'd just like to concur with what Simon uh, Bowser said. In fact, when we use the word jeopardising, I think if they tried to close it or anything like that, they'd certainly be jeopardising their stature within the community, etc. So I think that's very, very unlikely that they would do that. Thank you. Thank so you've got the recommendation before you. You're happy to speak? Great. 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 Thank you. <coughs> Let's go to the hills. And it's up resources issues now. Uh, corporate debt recovery policy, Council Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this uh, is the first of three that I'll be presenting. That's pretty uh, straightforward. We, this is the corporate debt recovery policy, which is the uh, the first time we've seen this actually in terms of uh, being reviewed for us uh, last few years. And uh, it's really essentially about a framework to recover monies owing to us. Of course, we have to bring the monies in to uh, 
sure we can run our services. And uh, we have an obligation to collect money as well. For this. It's pretty straightforward. It sets out across the, uh, the main policy and the sub policies uh, how we'll approach taking the money in and uh, pursuing it if necessary, where necessary. Uh, this, these documents are not about performance monitoring, but actually, uh, certainly, we do see this in the corporate planning information. Our rate of collection is very high because of our approach. And uh, really, the documents themselves actually really set out to make it very clear, very transparent how we approach things. And uh, some members actually may have seen recently there's been a little bit of controversy among yeah. some councils yeah. uh, on uh, and authorities on their collection methods. And uh, ours is really about taking uh, taking high standards and uh, applying it appropriately and fairly, and giving um, individuals and organisations opportunities to uh, give them an approach which is fair and balanced or still achieve the objectives. And uh, with that, share for that to uh, the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Councillor Randall? Yeah, I just wondered if the introduction of universal credits had any effect on any of these um, debts, because I know that obviously, you know, the people working there, they go on to any sort of benefit, they can run like, well, weeks and weeks behind, and then they're at risk of, you know, not paying their rent. And I've seen that as a question. Yeah. So I just wonder whether it has had any effect. <coughs> Uh, you, um, I can't give you um, information in terms of particularly uh, any universal credit cases. What I do know is in terms of those on benefit, the amount you can recover from is capped. So, but, and certainly we mentioned that later on in reports um, in terms of how much you can collect. So, even if a, a debt is sizable or builds up over time, those people are protected in the sense that we can only recover a certain amount uh, a week from the methods that we use. Thank you. I think we're going to yeah. uh, Certainly through um, demand for other services, um, I can't speak directly to the corporate debt policy or what happens in 13, but certainly through homelessness and housing. We are seeing changes to cases where homelessness is being caused by debts and people running into ventilators and facing eviction, um, but through no fault of their own people when they took on the tenancy it's affordable and then the circumstances have changed through welfare and it's not affordable. Um, but that is something that has been was first looked at by the work, uh, Welfare Reform Group, which has now changed its name to the Homeless Prevention Group, which um, Council Lord Chair. So we are aware of that, we are affected by that here as a, is every other council uh, nationally, and we're working through that. Thanks, Steve, that way. I have to say, oh, sorry, council. Yeah, it, it was just a question on a, a lot of um, the stuff we're doing, uh, and certainly in the, the housing area, is to do with uh, coaching, uh, trying to help and support individuals with regard to uh, coming up with budgets, how to, how to get themselves. Uh, looking through page 149 with regard to um, the, the process of dealing with debt. Do, do, do we do we proactively? I've, I've never. I've probably asked some many questions. I've never heard of it. Do we proactively, with regard to our own debt, put in people to help and assist uh, the person who owes us the money in coming up with some sort of plan and support with regard to getting those monies back, or, or is it just simply we refer them to somebody else? Or do we? Uh, we do have a debt liaison officer. Oh, yeah. uh, um, that's in the revenues and benefits team, but also through the homelessness one as well. They go through a plan <coughs> of, of not just helping them out in the situation they're in, but whatever they do them to, to make sure that things are good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Just Morgan. Thank you. I think throughout the, the policies, as you can see, it's, uh, it's really about being helpful, fair and balanced, and not taking the interest yeah. into a still pretty. And of course, anybody knows the uh, the tip here would be the one that uh, thinks the duty is done. Very good conversation. Well, you have to set the recommendation. Great. 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 Thank you. Chair. <coughs> this item is the annual review of the capital tax reduction scheme 19 stroke 20. That's the morning. Thank you, Chair. So this, uh, in some respects, obviously linked to the previous one. This is in respect of the, the, well, the recommendation is that no change is made to the current tenants tax resolution scheme. Um, the paper actually sets out a number of options, um, which we can look at in terms of the level of reduction. And as you can see on 4.20 on page 167, it's proposed that there is no change. 
and uh, we actually mean that we leave it, the proposal is to leave it at 20% uh, those people um, make, uh, who are of the uh, working age to pay that level. Mm -hmm. uh, we've obviously uh, discussed this each year, the figures are all set out. There is actually a small increase to us at the District Council. As we know that uh, the numbers are shared between the, uh, the authorities on which we collect the money on behalf of. The, the main thrust of this really argument is that actually it's a, a fine balancing act. If we increase it to a higher level, such as uh, perhaps 25 or even 30%, I know this doesn't always necessarily have uh, all member support if we increase it to that level, but not only that, it's not actually necessarily helpful to collect it to those level, uh, to collect at that level, because uh, in cases uh, with some authorities where those levels have been um, taken, it actually has a counterproductive effect, and actually less money is collected, and we go back to the situation where I was talking about earlier. Um, therefore, the, the cost to us are there in terms of uh, income that we forego, and also in terms of the increase to the, uh, the council by leaving in 20%, obviously, with the uh, what you might call fiscal drain in there. Um, so it's proposed that we take 20% and use that option, and that's what I'd like to put to, um, to stretch groups in. Basically, uh, sorry, I was going to say there are also um, some other reasons for that, uh, particularly at this stage where we in the future have. Uh, with the unitarisation have various different levels of harmonisation. Uh, it makes sense actually for members of the public uh, not having to go to a full consultation um, and for the individuals themselves affected that we don't increase it at this stage and we need 20%. Thank you. Yeah, just, just not so much on this one, but just looking forward, I don't know how it's going to go because I know Northampton Borough, their, their reduction is 35% and South Northampton is 8.5%. And now it's at 20 percent so somewhere we're going to see another hike i'd imagine and for our residents yeah. aren't we we'd potentially imagine, we don't know yet i'd imagine part of the negotiation either that or northampton borough are going to be happy it's just a big, big it's just going to be a big change <coughs> yeah the, that's about being on the same level but that, that's going to be talked about in the months ahead and the year and a half since that's one of the many things we've discussed it's just to have that sort of information about really yeah okay thank you for that one. Yeah, I was going to say, Chair, that that really actually reinforces the reason to leave it as it is on this occasion to uh, yeah. to put people's minds around. Right. Right. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. 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 Well, we have to agree the recommendations. Yeah. Agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And the last one, Chair, to remove is the criminalising the capital revenue budget in the federal national plan. Final one for me. Thank you. I'll take these as uh, the four items actually and give some narrative to each one. Thank you. So uh, the first one, 32, recommended that the 2019-20 budget plan and financial strategy be approved. Yep. That's actually Appendix A, which is on uh, page 183 of the paper. Uh, we have an obligation to put this to the member, uh, members. There's actually no proposal for any change here. It's uh, pretty straightforward and uh, should be familiar to members. And um, really, it's basically the, uh, the following key principles that are listed there. Yeah. So that's the first one. Uh, I wonder if there was any particular questions on that one, but take those later if there is. Uh, number two, the restricted growth bid criteria for 1920 budget be set, uh, set and be approved. This one actually is uh, in terms of signposts in 4.27 uh, of your papers, and that's really about the growth bid criteria. And again, there is no change proposed here. Okay. So basically, 4.27 outlines the, the bullet pointed items about those criteria which will give us uh, regard for uh, budget growth within the uh, uh, group bids. You can see quite simply, such as interest to save, health and safety, uh, statutory requirements, uh, compliance with existing legal obligations, schemes where external funds have been secured, or schemes that enable the authority to meet its objectives or affordable. And in fact, uh, you'll know that many of those can't be argued with. Uh, in fact, at one of the recent meetings uh, earlier this year, we looked at the building safety and uh, we had to put forward money to, to address the building. The third one is actually that the assumptions and proposals concern the financial strategy and development of the 1920 budget preparation process be approved. This really is the, the general scene set in a big picture that we can see throughout the paper, yeah. uh, which there are, uh, of course, many pages. 
but uh, some of the most, um, I'm not sure if to call it interesting areas, but of course, first of all, you'll see the table on page 174, which was already as approved in uh, July. Yeah. Of course, the interesting challenge we have going forward is it talks about projections going into the future, where uh, we probably won't be here anyway, but obviously we still have to look to the future and be prudent over the next couple of years. Uh, also in that table going forward, you'll see the 27, 2018 drop off uh, over the coming periods and be replaced with 23, 24, as we do, albeit, start looking forward. The, uh, finally, that the India 2018-19 budget groups, uh, group is to be approved, and that's actually with reference to section number five of your papers. And uh, I'll quickly mention a couple of those. So okay. you can see there we have uh, item one, I put one, uh, conservation area review program, which uh, we'll be discussing uh, uh, later actually. Uh, later in the agenda this evening, but obviously it's in there for now. We've got uh, building control, which uh, I understand, of course, Simon could refer to if we need any further detail, some powers. Uh, but that's actually uh, relation to our uh, collaboration with sort of the local authorities, uh, requiring just a small extra additional increase of money, £20,000. And uh, a couple of the others there, of course, which have been touched upon tonight, 5.3. 5.4 which are actually uh, linked around temporary accommodation and of course the concern was raised a little bit earlier in terms of housing stock and that was the requirement for another £180,000 and 152000 thereafter uh, around particularly the demands upon us uh, because of the requirements that Homeless uh, Reduction Act which came into force earlier in the year. And uh, then also in respect to 5.4 housing homelessness prevention, which uh, we're seeking uh, the 65,000 for this year and 75,000 for next year, uh, really around about those relations with uh, uh, hostels and uh, accommodation for people on uh, various uh, bases. Uh, I understand that not uh, not this evening, but in due course, uh, Marie will be uh, until we'll be presenting reports in that around longer term solutions which are more cost effective and uh, which can hopefully help those uh, individuals on a, on a, a longer term basis. Uh, and then finally we have uh, lodge road offices, again uh, related to various uh, needs in terms of our customers, needing to have more uh, space for interview. I think perhaps some of you may have been like me occasionally been here in the day and had uh, walked down the corridor and saw people being uh, perhaps interviewed or people waiting in those spaces downstairs, uh, not necessarily uh, perhaps dignified for them or helpful for them or also safety uh, practices for officers. So we need uh, to need to spend some more money on modif uh, modifying that area as well. And then finally, our lodge road office cleaner, a small, uh, a small increase uh, to pay for additional cleaning fees uh, for, the, for the offices as well because uh, of service demand. Basically, uh, the, the main point of all of these is really to keep us, as always, uh, a lot of change coming up, but to spend prudently where we need to and uh, make sure we manage our finances accordingly. <coughs> That's the uh, four items I'd like to put. Finally, I'd like to say actually there is a uh, mention in there, of course, about council tax for next year um, with uh, a recommendation of £5 increase. And again, there'll be another point there, of course, about harmonisation. Uh, but again, this is not for this occasion, and of course this really is a precursor to a later paper, of course later in the year, where we'll have more detail again. It's really about setting the scene and telling you what's coming. And with that, I'd like to propose uh, those four recommendations again. Very much did, Councillor Morgan. On business rates and pilots, we're looking to do a, a bid to government as a as part of the industry process, as part of our bid to actually get more money in to help sustainability. Yes, Thank you. You can see that, and actually, yeah. we'll have more detail on that in due course. That's right. uh, really, I suppose that paragraph tells you what's happening in terms of things that are happening, but it doesn't tell you what's happened at this point in time. That's why we Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wesley. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Morgan, for explaining all that. Um, on 4.23, uh, there's mentioned there, uh, and you also talked about scene setting for a certain council tax going forward. Um, I also have concerns about the special expenses that are levied on uh, 
in the paper at the time, and I do think that you should, as part of your scene setting and looking forward, you should be looking at, uh, at analysing those and reviewing them and coming back to us with uh, uh, what they actually are uh, for me and, uh, and are paying for. So if that could be uh, part of your plans, I would really appreciate it. Let's come back to the next part of the do everyone first and come back. Uh, thank you. Councillor Howard. Uh, mine was pretty much exactly the same question. I actually support the recommendation, but just want to OT on uh, the 80% higher at the PDC uh, charge, if the, sorry, don't charge compared to the national rate. Uh, and I would like to know if that does mean a special town uh, allowance for the town members uh, to go back to the residents. If it is, I'd like to have perhaps done that as well. But we don't have to charge it to our residents next year. Thank you. Any questions for Councillor Morgan? Not, I think that's more. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just a point of clarity in the advice, the recommendation for is that the bill to be approved. You see in the report on page 180, it's 7.5, it talks about the new road bin, a capital bin, yeah. respect to the road bridge, oh, it yeah. says that's separate deliberation later. Yeah. So just to make the point that that approval would be subject to council's decision on the road bridge straight. Thanks for that clarification, Simon. Thank you. So much appreciated. Yeah, of course, that is later on the evening as well. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to come back on the two comments there from uh, yeah, thank you. town members. So, as a also a town board member, I fully agree uh, with this. And of course, uh, as we know, there's uh, quite a deal of controversy um, with uh, this year's special expenses. That was obviously just uh, uh, in the planning before I became the resources portfolio order. And uh, I'll be taking a, an extra special interest in that this year and uh, hopefully, at the very least, not seeing such a large hike for the town members, sorry, the, you know, the town wards are therefore given the town board no, members a uh, particular challenge to explain that. And, um, it, it's one of those things where I think it's been, uh, many of us perhaps perhaps feel right or wrong in <coughs> some level of mystery, and uh, we'll be wanting some more clarity on that as well, particularly uh, in person. Thank you, Councilor Ward. Thank you, Chair. So there are the four recommendations. Thank you for the extra time. Do you accept the recommendations? Agreed. 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 Thank you, Mr. Dean Councillor Morgan. And we now move on to strategic planning issues. That's Councillor Chancellor. First one, acceleration of the Conservation Area Review Program. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there's a recommendation here which I wish to amend slightly. I'll mention that now and I'll mention it again when I finish. Thank uh, you. Just to make clear. At the end, the last sentence of the recommendation, currently it says that additional resources of £10,000 uh, this year and £49,000 next year be agreed to enable an acceleration of the Conservation Area Review Programme. I want to change the wording of the and the sense of the next sentence. Uh, so it now should read, this is to be funded from unallocated corporate underspends or reserves if required. Okay. A uh, slight change, but uh, I think it's significant. Um, conservation areas are an important part of uh, the planning policy framework, um, protecting our heritage and making sure that all development is sensibly plan-led, um, irrespective of whether or not there's a neighbourhood development plan, a conservation area can help to provide a balancing factor. It's becoming clearer, you'll see from the next, uh, from paragraph 4.1, that we haven't done any work on this for a very long time, until quite recently. And during this work, it's becoming clearer that uh, the depth of understanding of what is meant by a conservation area and the significance of it, it is not very good in uh, the general world, as it were. Uh, and we've had some difficulties uh, with the work that we've been doing, and they've all been due to a lack of understanding or a misunderstanding of what it is we're at. I don't propose to give you a lecture on conservation areas now, Chairman, you'll be pleased to learn, but we have done some extra work, and the staff in particular have done some excellent extra work in uh, formulating an approach to making sure that the information available to people is clearer uh, and more readily available. But I would like to say at this point that we do rely on elected members here and parish councils in particular 
keeping their people informed of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, because those gaps in, in that information have caused us some difficulty. I even had a meeting recently with representatives of a parish and their opening gambit was, we don't trust you and we don't believe a word you say. Um, I'm before pleased. you opened your mouth, was it? <laughs> <laughs> that was before I'd said anything, but I'm pleased to report that by the end of the meeting, they had slightly shifted that position uh, in, in a sensible direction. Um, we did resolve uh, four years ago, nearly five years ago, to allocate some of the additional fees from planning to uh, fund conservation area function at review, uh, but it took a long time to find somebody, uh, so we didn't actually begin the work until two years ago. But in that time, we have a lot of progress that has been made, as you can see from page 186. Six conservation areas have been reviewed or uh, and uh, designated following appropriate consultation. A further five have been uh, reviewed and are out of either proposed to go out to consulta consultation shortly, come to the next meeting of this group, currently out to consultation, or in one case of Eden Beck, have been out to consultation and have been revised accordingly, and that comes up later in this agenda. On the assumption that the reviews listed there in, in uh, Table 2 are completed, a total of 11 conservation areas will either have been freshly designated or recently reviewed. Um, we will then have 28 conservation areas, but 17 of them wouldn't have been reviewed. I think it's important that we continue this work and build on the success of recent times, Chairman. Yeah, uh, well, we can. And so all we're asking here is that additional resources be allocated to enable the programme of review of conservation areas to be accelerated and, if appropriate, expanded. Thank you, Mr. Dee. Presumably we have the staff resource to do that. Well, yes. I think um, you'll see that in the papers it says that uh, the heritage policy officer should be engaged full-time and is engaged full-time on conservation area work and that a student conservation officer spends approximately three days of work a week doing that and uh, we would like to look at the possibility of at least include um, continuing with that and possibly uh, looking at the pos uh, of employing an officer to help with the, the work further. Uh, so just to remind you what I said earlier, the recommendation now reads that additional resources of £10,000 this year, £49,000 next year will be agreed to enable an acceleration of the conservation area review programme, and this will be funded from unallocated corporate number spend or reserves if required. Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Uh, Joe can say thank you. That uh, is the item we're referring to in the previous paper. That's oh. a clarification of the thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wondered who monitors and polices it because there's been um, a few um, within the town that have, um, there's a pub just up the road that's, I think it's a grade two listed building, and they went ahead and um, you know put up new signage and everything else. It's in the conservation area. And it wasn't until a member of the public brought it to the attention that you know it then got highlighted. So I just wondered, and there's been quite a few around the town that sat in the conservation area, and they've done the work's been carried out before a member of the public reported it. So I just wondered, do does everybody who lives in the conservation area are they all made fully aware, and how they are made fully aware, and if they are made fully aware, what, when they don't adhere to what they should be doing, what happens? Really, yours, Chairman, if I may, I was the, the, the latter point, never able to deal with the visual In terms of making people aware, when the conservation area is freshly designated, everyone uh, within the area is written to and told you are now in the conservation area with the summary of what that means. And that is then obviously relevant to pass on if you sell a house or whatever you should declare to a future purchaser. In terms of enforcement. Yes, through you, Chairman. Planning is a permissive regime, but 
conservation areas and listed buildings are different, they're different legislation, and anyone who's doing any work on those without permission is actually committing a criminal offence. So uh, we are very reliant on the people telling us um, when activities are happening, and they do. So, you know, we, we go around, we use, and then we use, go for our enforcement policy to seek to get that, either to get um, a mission, um, invite them to make an application, stop work and, and go through the proper process. Or if it's a really serious offence, we can take immediate action and stop, um, stop things happening and prosecute. Just coming back on that, if somebody does see some work happening in a conservation area that hasn't um, come through any sort of planning like that, they report here immediately. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Gilbert. Okay, my question is that um, you know, we're in this position of, of loosely, you know, being behind in our conservation um, appraisals because we had a recruitment issue, if I remember, that um, we couldn't recruit to the post and we didn't undertake the um, conservation appraisals because our raised this each year. So um, we, we've got behind. Now we're um, having new resources which it is to do a catch-up. So is this a fixed term um, contract or is this a permanent contract? Because in theory you will then catch up and you'll have the resource, more resources than you require if you're following your five. So, if you're it's a fixed term set of resources and the Chief Executive has approved subject to your approval finances a fixed so it's not permanent. Exactly. So I just wanted to check that out. Councillor Ritchie? I, I, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to follow up the, the, the question asked by Councillor Randall. Um, is any officer able to tell us just roughly how many instances occur during the year for people reporting um, unauthorised actions within a conservation area? I mean, is, you know, what is the extent of the problem? I don't have the information channel. Okay. Yeah. If you get the information you like and then come back to the meeting, do you think it's relevant? Yeah. I suppose it's an indicator. Well, it's just an indication yeah. that you know, if we spend a lot of time yeah. and money yeah. on, you know, on establishing conservation areas, yeah. um, you know, it would be useful to know just you know, what effect is actually happening. Uh, we, um, there's the operational team in the development control who dealing with the light applications. Team and planning policy, and they do work together, and there's definitely a crossover because we share a student post, which is uh, advertised each year. Now, you've got three different people in the government control working on certain areas. They, their applications are free of charge. There are no barriers to people making applications. People are encouraged to make applications. Um, people are invited to make applications. I think it would actually be impossible to answer your question because actually every application or every pre-application we get might have been come about because somebody's reported somewhere. Because actually, what's it's a criminal offence to do work on listed building without permission. Sometimes people are doing a small thing because they don't realise they need permission for that small thing. So I think we have, we, you know, we're proportionate by, um, and officers engage. To do, their, to do their very best to protect heritage, but also find a solution that works for you. Thank you very much indeed. Can we move to the recommendation? Great. With the amended recommendation, are you happy to agree? Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, next one, uh, Councillor Charlton, to register the Westport Hampshire Strategic Plan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there are three recommendations here. Uh, members will remember that in May uh, we considered a report out, outlining initial proposals on managing the growth of Westport Huntingshire, including how we would work with our partners to produce a joint review of the West North Huntingshire Joint Core Strategy, which was adopted in 2014, the end of 2014. And we agreed that that, that, that should continue. Uh, so work has continued at officer level to progress this, seeking to ensure appropriate plan making arrangements have been in place. 
and it's particularly important because the government wants to boost significantly the supply of housing, that's in the NPPF, and they have given a particular uh, focus of interest on the Oxford Milton Keynes Cambridge Arc or corridor, depending on what you'd like to call it. Uh, so strategic planning in Northamptonshire local government reform proposals also requires some consideration when we look here. We have uh, produced a um, statement of common ground and uh, in draft form, and that is available, and some, uh, I think it's an appendix to this report, the, alongside the plan is the local development scheme, which is basically a timetable of how things will be done. And uh, we have got in front of us a draft memorandum of cooperation in terms of reference for this uh, joint planning arrangement, whatever it's to be called, presumably when, in two years' time when the, the separate councils become a unitary authority, that will be much simpler. It's now suggested that the, this council, Northampton and South Northamptonshire, each have three members and on this body, and that, where possible, this should include at least one person from each of the three who is an elected member of the county council. Um, previously, the Joint Strategic Planning Committee, which after two years of trying, we got abolished at the beginning of this year. Uh, that had representatives specifically from the county council, but uh, that's not necessary for the West North Hampshire planning. But it's suggested that where possible, uh, that could have been covered by having the, at least one person from each council who is already an elected member of the county council while it exists. The growth deal, the West Northamptonshire growth deal, um, offers investment and potentially various freedoms and flexibilities <coughs> in exchange for our levels of growth, and we need to take that into consideration in our future planning, and we are looking at that as well. But to allow for both short-term and sustained increasing in delivery of housing, the overall growth deal will contain three main elements, which I've highlighted there as bullet points. Acceleration of existing commitments. Let's make sure that people get on and do what they said they would do. We need to make better use of land in Northampton Borough. Although, just to remind you, the borough have identified enough sites within their boundary for their own anticipated growth within the current core strategy and that new settlements and urban extensions on garden town lines might be offered as part of the West North Hampshire growth deal as part of the Oxford Milton Keynes Cambridge Art development. And these will come either at the end of this year or early next year to this group. So what uh, the recommendations are that the Statement of Common Ground, which is in Appendix A, and I hope you've read, be agreed, that the Local Development Scheme, which is in Appendix B, <coughs> be agreed and brought into effect on a date to be agreed with the other two participating councils, and that the Memorandum of Co Cooperation in Terms of Reference also be agreed, Chair. Members, do you have any questions or comments? Very comprehensive. I happen to accept the Thank you. Uh, and this item, Council Chancellor, is Freedom's and No Bottle British Design Spend Supplementary Planning Document. Yeah, this is, a, this is an easy one, Chairman, I hope. Um, we've, seen, we've, seen, uh, we've seen this document before when it was brought to us and with the request that it be agreed that it go out to consultation, yep. which it's done. Uh, in uh, in uh, accord with our usual practice, we have reproduced for your benefit all of the consultation responses, which I'm sure you've all studied in detail. Um, 
If not, do remember that winter is approaching and it makes good fire lighting. Um, so those responses have been considered and the village design statement has been uh, adjusted in, in accordance with that and that further mining and editorial changes might be necessary to reflect the fact that we are hoping that it will be in its final adopted form. So, the recommendations, Chairman, are that the proposed changes be approved and that further changes be uh, made in order to bring it into the right format for adoption and that it then be adopted. I just draw members' attention to the top of page 226 where it said that the, we had a lot of input from the Orthorpe State, as you can imagine, yeah. <coughs> because that, that is no bubble Brinkton's, uh, and uh, they were very concerned about the use of the term preserved throughout the document. Remember this document was written by the communities, not by this council, yes. uh, and uh, because it implies that no change is acceptable, mm -hmm. And so it's proposed that the alternative terms such as conserve or protect would be inserted where necessary uh, because these imply that change is allowed, uh, which uh, I think frees up the concerns particularly of the authority state. So I don't think there's anything else to say. Thank you, Councillor Chancellor. We've got three recommendations before this committee. Are there any questions or comments first? If not, you're happy to agree. Thank you. Uh, the last paper we've got to the is the Weed and Beck Conservation Area Appraisal and Management Plan for Conservation Area Designation. I think all stretch group members received an email today from Councillor David Smith, who was a member of the Weed, and no doubt you received that Councillor Chandler. So yes, I have. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, members will remember that uh, we had to defer the um, decision of this uh, right. conservation area because, um, or postpone it rather than defer it, because um, we needed further work to be done and further discussion with the community, in particular the parish council, <coughs> who were under a lot of misunderstandings about the the significance and implication of the conservation area here and uh, you are, again this time we've given you the um, responses to this consultation the Brimpton etc ones came last meeting uh, and you'll see that um, there was quite a, a, a healthy response responses varied from we don't need conservation areas at all because we've got listed buildings uh, and uh, to why don't you make the whole place, the whole village a conservation area, why have you sort of picked out bits? Uh, and this I think Chairman reflects the uh, lack of understanding of the significance and uh, meaning of conservation areas in general. So um, a lot of work has been done on the conservation area and on consultation with the, the, the public and uh, particular note was made of the significance of the Royal Ordnance Depot but we believe that it doesn't need to be contained in a conservation area because it is suitably protected in its own right and is uh, some parts of it are developing quite nicely. Um, so a lot of work was done on this particular conservation area appraisal and management plan and the suggestion now is that proposed changes as a result of the consultation be approved, uh, that the usual further minor editorial changes be made to bring it to its adopted form and that it be adopted as a supplementary planning document and the boundary as set out in the document that you have before you this evening, Appendix C, be designated as conservation areas and the local list entries be agreed. These are for uh, local views of structures of particular interest. 
And that further work be undertaken to a proposed Article 4 direction for specific properties before that comes back to this group, Chairman. Uh, we did have representation from uh, local member David Smith, who is concerned about the Article 4 uh, direction and the uh, rarity of its use elsewhere and why, why do we always include this. Well, we, we include this because there are uh, some specific properties, and it's very few usually, that need just that extra touch of protection. Um, Article 4 basically removes permitted development rights so that people have to apply uh, and that means that any suggested changes are subject to appropriate review. So those are the recommendations, Chairman. We received Councillor Chuckler. Any comments or questions? Councillor Aldrich. Yeah, just with regard to the Article 4, um, I, I don't, uh, this isn't my area of expertise, obviously, but, but there does appear to be a concern uh, from the parish and from the member with regard to this area. I'm just wondering, uh, and it probably has been done, whether um, that could be responded to specifically with regard to an explanation um, so that the parish uh, and uh, Councillor uh, uh, David Smith, uh, not David Smith, yeah. yes, yeah. Sir, yeah. Sir, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, is, is, has his concerns resolved, Chair? Well, let me start with that. Uh, as far as the community are concerned, they did raise that concern during the discussion, and we did it our best to explain to them the significance of the Article 4 direction and the fact that adopting the conservation area and the uh, management plan designation, etc., doesn't immediately invoke an Article 4 direction for anything, that that is subject to further work and consultation and will come back as a separate matter. I don't know if anybody at the table has got anything to add to that. Chairman, I think what I can usefully add is the intended strategy from here, which we have worked with closely with the Parish Council, is there will be a, and it is a short list of what is proposed to affect the Article 4 direction and the details of what will be affected in each case. We shared in the first instance with the Parish Council after that, it will be some consultation with the residents concerned uh, and eventually work its way through, if there is support for it, to a formal Article 4. But it's some way off, and it is far from a sort of blanket uh, removal of rights. It is targeted at the things which make the weed and conservation area special mm -hmm. in the particular cases where that additional protection is felt to be needed. It's very targeted uh, and selected. I've got no doubt that everything you've been done has gone forward. It just appears to be there is something about that that continues is unresolved. Either they're not listening, or I'm, I'm just as long as we're happy that we have responded to their specific concerns. Um, uh, if it's just the fact that they continually are uncomfortable with it for whatever reason, then that's a different matter. But uh, it obviously was raised again. I had a phone call uh, this evening about it. Uh, and, and I just want to make sure it's probably something to be more resolved than us to change direction. I would suggest so, Chairman. I, I haven't seen Councillor Smith's email, so I don't know the content of that. Um, but but yeah, the, I'll do that. the essential points, I suspect, are similar to the which was previous in answers from the previous link. Um, it's a perfectly legitimate point of view that you don't like additional controls there, or, or yeah. all that members can yeah. sign in due course. But the proposal for the next one is we do additional work and we come back with specific proposals. We've got a council to come as well. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, you're happy to agree the six recommendations? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Chapman. We'll now move on to page 502, 503. As you know, it's not the biggest agenda we had in recent weeks. Well, it works. Echo with regeneration employment issues, uh, disposable land, half, halfway leading to country country park, Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for some years, the uh, council has rented part of the uh, country park on the Canal River Trust. And on that land, there is a little used informal park, a narrow strip of land leading from the Lumberby Road down towards the dam. Uh, a 
as part of uh, land assembly and the developers eventually uh, controlling the land in the northeast sea there, uh, it's proposed, it has been proposed, uh, that uh, it has been proposed that Devonshire District Council surrender. extends to little under an acre, little under an acre right, in an area. Uh, it's proposed that that is the one that is on that part of the land, <coughs> so that the Canal and River Trust can uh, sell the land to the developers, the first of land assembly and ultimately development of the land itself. Uh, in return, DDC would take a modest sum, a share of any value that was realised by the selling uh, to uh, the developers. Um, so the recommendation is that the parcel of land forming a pathway from Gavitry Country Park to Long Buckley Road be surrendered from the on the basis set out in the report. Thank you, Councillor James. Uh, Councillor Wesley first. Thank you again, Chair. Um, I'm not overly happy about this. I think, I think we might be missing a, a little bit of a trick, and I do dispute the fact that it's little used and overgrown, because I actually walked along this morning, so to say that it's, uh, to say that it's overgrown is, uh, is not actually 100% uh, correct, by any manner of means. Now, this path used to be used much more until the country park wasn't managed maybe in a manner that you might expect it to be. Since um, this year, it's, uh, there's been more work done, and the country park entrance to it, the, the gateway, etc., has actually been cleared. And you can clearly see that this path is worn. There's a track that follows this path up to the road. It is a useful path from the current Long Buckley Road, particularly if you've got mountain biking coming back from Long Buckley. It's the northern side of town, it's an actual, actually a useful path. Also, going forward, I understand obviously that this is a sewer and it's already going, it's going to be built. But to actually get rid of it now, it seems to be a little bit premature. This path gives us a little bit of a bargaining tool in maintaining a path across those across that position, which could quite easily, going over the next road, actually join up with Borough Hill, where the footpath emerges. So what we've got there is a really, 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 really nice opportunity for a little bit of green infrastructure to join up with where the canal would have gone, joining back with the country park, which make a really, really valuable route which I'm sure will be enjoyed by not only people of the town and the surrounding area, but people from further afield, which would give them, which would give them probably a, a, an easily a five mile walk in, in semi countryside, if not walking through the, the through the sea as part of that. And I think maybe, maybe it's not exactly that path at the end of the day, but maybe there's a little bit of a bargaining tool that can be used to ensure that we can do that going forward. And I would suggest that we that we don't actually relinquish our rights on it at the moment, but actually keep it in abeyance until we know what we can actually get out of the developers and make something actually happen. Because we're told it's a modest amount of money, and I assume that that's not the important factor. Um, don't know how much that is, but I'm sure it is insignificant. And is it going to is it going to make much difference? So I would actually ask you to reconsider this and, and not do it. Thank well, thank you, Steve, for your local knowledge this one, Mark. It's very helpful. Councillor Osborne? Um, I support the last councillor's view. We don't very often support each other, do we? But, um, it does happen, Steve. Um, I know the area extremely well. Um, <coughs> I used to fish the reservoir with a boat before it became, I mean, it was a private syndicate. Um, that particular road was also, um, wasn't just a path, it was a road. You could drive down there. Um, and I've driven down there to fish fishing competitions for Daventry Angling Club when it had the rides to fish in that bank. Um, 
like the previous speaker said, it's all overgrown and horrible, and it's right on the bend, just before the house, where everybody crashes into the wall. Um, we all know it, don't we? Um, exactly what it says. I would have thought to have had a pathway, or a roadway, to that side of the reservoir, to give that up would be wrong. Um, the amount you're going to get for it is probably peanuts. They're going to sell it to the developer, it will go forever. And I, I think it's premature, in fact, not just premature, I don't think it will be sold at all. I don't think you want to give it up, and I think the um, previous speaker is dead right. Thank you, Steve, for that. Uh, Councillor Randall? Um, yeah, I agree with Councillor Wesley, um, and I just wondered if my Councillor Wesley's walked along it today and said it's a very well on track, why in the report it says there's very little use by the public, so how, how, do, how are those assessments so different because, you know, somebody not knowing the area and just think how much you use is it, let's get rid of it, but clearly they do and it's clearly a valuable route um, and it's something that I feel we should keep hold of. Thank you. Councillor Howard? Wait no, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's gone. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I use it every now and again as well. It, it, it is a relatively decent walk back into town. Um, I don't know what the costs are of maintaining it, um, so that would only be my concern. Of it. I, I wasn't keen on it, uh, to be honest with you. I was going to vote that maybe if it's going to help the development and all the things that it's going to assist, which it says in the policy, improve the town econ economics, etc., development of the town. Promote health and safety. If it's going to do these things, then obviously, well, okay, it's another path. But if there's a huge cost of maintenance, then yes, I would walk somewhere else. But we, we do walk around that area back into town and by the sidewalk again. So okay. it's on my patch. Yeah, I mean, the country park's part of my portfolio. And it's a route that I do walk. Now, sometimes it's busy, sometimes it isn't. I agree it is overgrown there, but there is no doubt you can see that it is a pathway. Not overgrown according to what council. And at times, or it had, you know, it has been. At, 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 at times, um, it's quite busy. So I think we need to personally sort of have another look at this. Okay, thank you. Well, so yeah. instead then, then uh, just to come back to years ago, the Dumtree Blombuffy Road wasn't very busy. Um, and people parked there and people drove down that road. It was quite easy. Nowadays, along with the Dumpty Road, it's very, very busy. Yeah. You can't park on that bend because you'd end up like all the cars do in the wall, a bit further around, you'd be smashed. A lot of the dog walkers then continued on um, after the fishermen. So it's the fact you can't get a vehicle near there. It is a little way up the road. Um, so, except for walkers, that's probably why it's not used as much as what it was. But, but there is enough space for you to get into it. Yeah. Okay. Where's the Councillor Howard again? Yeah. Um, it's not overgrown like it was. That's what I can say. And it's a great place to walk the dog, I believe. Yeah. So, you know. Okay. Um, we've got a view here, actually, uh, so that this uh, might, might be a bit premature. Bear in mind the the series I'd like to actually happen maybe for some years. And so some members are saying, actually, can we hold it off a bit? And some members are saying, don't do it at all. Just wonder what your take on it is. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yes. Members, I, I appreciate the points made, and certainly the, the idea of running a route through that area is in the master plan for the surf, and running up to Borough Hill in many ways makes excellent sense. I mean, no, no one would dissent from that. The, the practical point here is that the uh, Sioux developers need to have control of the land within the Sioux if they are to bring forward a comprehensive scheme of development. The planning system can be used to protect important green corridors, important pathways, and secure new rights of way. So I think fears that it will be lost forever are misplaced. It's just which tools you use to achieve the outcome. If the North East Sioux is not able to proceed, an obstacle to it, then the Council's housing land supplies put under pressure, and that has very undesirable consequences you'll be aware of. Uh, so I entirely understand the concerns that have been raised and in our negotiations with the CRC and through them, the developer, we'll try and secure what outcomes we can to protect public access in the meantime before development takes place. But I would encourage you to prove the disposal nonetheless because we do need that development to be able to proceed. So is there any ways we could use them to give some assurance 
but there'd uh, be a pathway somewhere near there. I mean, if you haven't got control of it, but can we actually try and get a position where we can that route will still be there? Yeah? Um, yes, yes, I'm going to try to do that. Sorry, Richard. Yeah, I hear a lot of tries, and we don't like tries, do we? I will try to do that. Um, well, first of all, one question is: Is it? I don't know this area. I'm, I'm taking uh, counsel from people that do know the area. At one point, it's obviously uh, uh, struck a nerve here. Is first of all, uh, is it imperative that it happens now? I.e., is it critical that it happens now? And the other issue is: Is if it is transferred now? Will the public still be able to use it in the meantime? Because you know about developments take time, things change, etc., well, etc. Et et so you know, would it be something that could still be used? Um, because it could be, I don't know, five, ten. It could, could be any length of time. But to actually then lose it as a facility uh, because they actually, I don't know, called it off or anything, would would, would have an impact on, on the way I feel about it. Chairman, uh, that would be helpful. Two, two, two things. In, in, in the case of does it need to be done now, yes, really it does. We are really quite keen to get a planning application for Devon Signal Beast in. It is already delayed by a number of years from its original date, and we know, or it's been very strongly suspect, that one of the key reasons there isn't a planning application is the developer has not gone all that. Um, so it is important to resolve that. But I take the second point entirely, and I probably suggest to the committee that um, at the end of the recommendation we add the words subject to uh, public access being maintained until the development takes place. We've got the councillor, um, Howard again. Yeah, sorry Chair, I keep coming back on this. Um, because I do use it, I do have concerns about it, so is there a possibility we can defer this to the next stretch of the meeting? It's not on the way. Just well, I've just been told no, that's what we've been told by the officers. It's not ideal. Can we take a vote on that? Because well, we'll come to that point. Oh, okay. Uh, Councillor Chantler? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, this is not a designated right of way. Mm -hmm. It's not on the definitive map. It's not a statutory footpath. Yeah. So, um, will the public still continue to have access? They're lucky to have access at the moment because uh, it's only because. It's been allowed. Fair point, that's all for Well, it may not be a statutory right of way or a statutory access, but it's been used since the 60s. Um, I have used it, and I'm sure other people have, uh, have used it. I cannot believe that to give up the rental of this piece of land, and we're talking about one acre, would stop the complete development, or would hold the complete development of. Now, the one acre would, would go back to British Waterways. British Waterways would get a monetary gain, presumably, from selling it off to the developer. And what you're saying is, unless that sale of land goes through from British Waterways to the developer, the development might not take place. Um, I, I can't see why not. Why do they have to build houses, or why do they need the rights? To come right next to the reservoir. Okay, that's our side of the question. Well, I, I don't understand it. Uh, Chairman, the, the pathway severs the site. It completely se separates two sections of the site. That, that's why it matters to them. If, if you look at the plan, Are you going to put, if you look at the plan on page 506. Yes. Um, 506? Yeah. It says sever the site. It does sever the site, doesn't it? I go back to Steve. Yeah, I, 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 I think the fact that we don't want it to prevent development, that, that's really important because um, although it apparently is used, it, it's, it's not a major thoroughfare or a footpath no, no, as, as a designated, etc. But we seem to have a solution here. We seem to have a solution. You know, we know uh, development can delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed, as long as we get some sort of policy or agreement to say, look, we'll continue using it, status quo, but when it is required, uh, the then we'll, the yeah, which, which is, and I think that amendment, uh, uh, fellow councillors, <coughs> is, is, is a win-win situation. Thank you. Councillor Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think uh, Simon does have some merit saying it can be used, but I think the, the point going back to Councillor Wesley earlier 
was about having it perhaps as a part of a circuit, etc., uh, sort of uh, a walk and retaining it. What didn't, uh, what Simon didn't have in there is perhaps using that as a public walkway for the future. I think that was one of the other concerns that uh, I think members had. And would it be possible to have that as a reassurance that that could be in the, uh, in the developments? There's actually a, a corridor there in that way. Chairman, uh, there's pretty two questions. Here. Could, could it be done? Yes. Um, and I think as part of the development plan for the Sioux, it, it should be done. Um, it's something that we can look out for and make sure it's addressed as part of the planning application and conditions that have been applied. Um, I think there's sort of an implied second question, which is, should we try and achieve that through a negotiation over this piece of land? Yes. And there I think we're probably stretching our negotiating uh, elastic beyond that which it will bear. Now, I could be wrong, um, but I think that is a, probably an excessive risk to take. So I suggest for this purpose we protect what we've got, and that's what Peter's going to words. Just keep further words again, please. Um. I was suggesting that at the end we are subject to public rights of access being maintained until development commences. There will be no public rights of what? access. Is it a public right of access? No. It's been used since. It's not designated, that's a point to make. Chairman, I'd like to clarify that. It might be helpful to clarify that. There isn't a public right of way, as Councillor Townsend rightly said, um, but if we have a contractual arrangement with the owners that says the public have the right of access, then as long as that contractual obligation has effect, the public will have a contractual, yeah. I suppose, exactly the normal essay right of access, just like they do now. They have to buy a lot of access. It does. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, it just seems to me rather strange that the developers have been working on this project for years. They must have spent tens, hundreds of thousands on preparing the plans. And yet, they're only raising this issue and wanting this be, be the actual ownership of this bit of land now. That doesn't strike me as being terribly credible. I can understand that if they're, going to, if they're developing the site and this, this, this little corridor goes through the middle of it, cutting it into two, that from the purposes of building works, they are going to want to cross from one side to the other. And they will need to, you know, that, 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 that's only, I think, reasonable that during construction, there is going to be a period in which that, that track will not be usable. But that surely doesn't necessarily mean that we, you know, that we give the thing up for good. I would have thought it should be perfectly possible to say that, look, um, looking into the future, we want, we want to continue to, to, you know, to have that, um, that track there for the use of, of walkers. We want it to be there um, for, you know, for the access it provides to the end of the you know, reservoir and so on. Um, we will, however, accept that there will be a period where they require, for, for construction purposes, they require access across it, that we are perfectly happy that it, you know, it, 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 it closes. But when that construction work is completed, for the moment, our view should be that we actually retain it. Um, oh. Chairman, I, I think what I suggest is the planning system will achieve that um, because public access and ability to move around in healthy ways is an important objective of the planning system. So I think it will achieve that through the planning application and approval in due course. Um, so no, no real disagreement about that. In terms of the credibility of the developer's approach, I confess we find it very surprising as well. They must have spent like, a very significant amount of money by now uh, to have done so before conforming the land is unusual. Um, Didn't they just missed it? Well, no, because we, we are aware that in one piece of land they were also needing to control. So, okay. well, I might so find out okay. 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 If we rely on the planning system, as someone has just said, yeah. But we get a planning application in, let's say there's two houses built straight across the road in the planning application. You can't say to an applicant when it comes to planning committee, I don't like that, we'd like a different setup. Um, um, members can't, so should it come to a planning committee with a house across the road, that, that's, that's exactly, we have no influence at all. The influence is before it actually comes to planning committee. Um, well, Jim, the 
the nature of an application for a site like this, as you'll appreciate, uh, you've dealt with many of them, is that you have a master plan, um, you have a design code, and all the other bits and pieces. You, you, many of you will have seen the indicative master plans that I've been preparing. They do show a substantial green corridor through here. Now, it may not be exactly on the same line as the current path, and I don't think anyone will be too concerned about that, but in the same general area, there is a substantial green corridor shown running from the corner of the country park out along Rugby Road and the yard. Um, so I, I think the point has been taken on board by actually this developer and the previous developer have the same sort of wedge uh, shown that it sort of makes sense. Um, I, I think it's on the first building house, of course, it actually you've got enough planning policy to be able to say no, that is a, a sensible thing to do. Right, so the applicant will submit a plan that shows a corridor very close to where the existing one is at the moment. Yes. to enable you to get to the country park. So, so then the, when the argument now from the committee being raised is what happens between then and now? Uh, so now and then, rather. Um, can, can it suddenly be closed? And what's it all? Or, or can we keep using it? Chairman, the words I've suggested for the recommendation, the original words, would have the effect of contractually requiring the may open until construction starts. Clearly, as Councillor Bucci has acknowledged, it may need to close whilst construction is taking place because you can't necessarily have pedestrians mixing heavy construction plans. Right. Um, but once that phase of construction was out of the way, it would reopen under the terms of the planning application and away you go. Thank you, Mr. Black. Councillor Howard? Yeah, uh, last time, Chair, I'm sorry to go on about this, but the, um, I have full credibility with the planning department and the senior managers who give us um, their explanations on what they see, but I don't know how. I really struggle with some of the developers uh, over many years who have been promised to do many things for this town and not delivered. Um, and then when they do, they haven't, sorry Simon, they haven't delivered some of their promises. I was going to the developments around the town, but especially around the Lang Farm area, schools, etc., um, which they, we, we have had to assist and, and help. Um, I don't have a lot of credibility with a lot of these developers, I'm very sorry, but I, I can't. I the chair of planning, <laughs> I think they're trying to mitigate the risk there. Wait. Yeah, well, I get yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I think my point was along the same lines. Um, I've heard Ian say over and over again these developers you know, are ruthless, you can't trust them. Um, and again, my concern was going to be we give concessions and things don't happen. That's my worry. While it's in our control, we've got control. Um, and then generically, I mean, even on the big developments where we're saying we're going to have this amount of affordable housing or this amount of shared, it comes back, it's not financially viable, the developer finds a way around it. These developers just seem to just not carry the truth. <laughs> I'm just saying, a developer, yeah. it's a business, yeah. and they are ruthless because they're business people, and nothing else much really matters to them. No, but we have a juicy as members, so it's taking the bigger picture. Yeah. And uh, we, we've done well against the developers sometimes, we do actually get yeah. hold into account. There are some who will work in the same way, ignore things. That's the duty of our officers, the planning officers, to make sure they do actually do what the planning mm -hmm. application says. Or yeah. well, the approval says, but sometimes they change it. We know that we had that one before. Oh. We come back after us and start changing conditions. But I think on this one, I thought we had mitigation in here about the path being open until the build takes yeah. place. That when the build takes place, there might be a temporary period where the path won't be there, or path a path won't be there. And after that is completed, there's still be a path there for the users to use. Now that, to my mind, seems a fairly, if that's right, son, yeah. seems a fairly reasonable outcome. And you can't get through planning unless you do show that. That's right, that's the point, yes. Right. So, back to you, Councillor Morgan. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Did, uh, maybe someone should have said it, but did some, some people... Was there another piece of land as well, so they've also got issues on the top? Well, not sure that's that relevant to this, have they? relevant to this, but, uh, but the, the wider question was going to be, is it, in, in, particularly if it's ours, is there going to be another occasion later on where we're having a similar discussion? Chairman, it's not our land. Um, um, no, but, I was, but the question was that I didn't know actually who it belonged to, that was the point. Yeah, so, yeah, it's not with us, it's not with us. Okay, right. I think we'd like to close, it's quite a long debate actually.
for the market, as long as one tonight. So we've got a recommendation before us. I do want to, sorry, can I, my apologies, Councillor James, it's your well, call, I, th I think Councillor Charles will answer for me. I, as far as I'm aware, and I can remember as a kid down yeah. there, there was never a footpath there at all. Okay. In fact, the, the footpath that might have been there, which is not shame, is when you go around Country Park and walk around the periphery of it, pass it down, and then come back up to the long Road. There was a pathway on the other side of the hedge. On the other side of the hedge. And that may have been, I don't know, maybe on a definitive map. There was a pathway there. And it used to come out by that little bridge. Uh, okay. Snake bridge, as you call it. Um, but Are you happy with the proposed amendment to the recommendation? I'm quite happy with the amendment. Yes. Uh, okay, if, thank you. If the officers are. I'm quite happy with We'll the take that to the vote then. Those in favour of the amended recommendation, please show. Those against? One, two, three, four, four. Okay, so the recommendations carried. The amended recommendations carried. Well, thank you very much for that long debate. Sorry, oh, Steve, this is deadline. We now move on to the second one, Councillor James. Great. Strengthening of Hedgeman Road Bridge. Well, as uh, members might be aware, we've had a little problem uh, down at Hedgeman Road Bridge in Charles Walton. Yeah. Uh, this bridge forms part of the uh, KTB Aerospace project. Yeah. In fact, it belongs to, uh, to the owners of car. Um, the thing is, the bridge uh, has been used for a long, long time, even though uh, it's probably in, a in, a, in danger of collapse. Um, vehicles have been using over that the county council were aware of it. And whilst this isn't any longer the county council, it's not their responsibility, that bridge. Uh, they are responsible for the surface of the road over it. And uh, in order to protect the public, they decided, uh, first of all, on a weight restriction limit, which people ignored, uh, and then finally, in order to uh, they closed the road entirely. This has resulted in people from the villages nearby having to do about a six mile detour on their journey uh, to get into Daventry, say, or to get down to Boundary, or whatever, uh, which is highly unsatisfactory, both from the point of view of residents, uh, businesses, and so forth, including farmers as well. So, uh, Catesby, uh, this total project is going to cost about 21 million. Uh, their car uh, has received something like 4.5 million, I think, in grant numbers. So, of course, they've expended a lot of money on it for the temporary access. Uh, spending something like £350,000 on strengthening that bridge uh, might be the final straw that breaks the camera's back and uh, puts an end to this development. So in order to uh, reopen the road, uh, the bridge needs strengthening and filling in underneath. Strengthening by the means of a uh, concrete channel and then filling in underneath that. That's going to cost uh, about 300 the developers have expended an awful lot of money so far putting in an access road uh, and so on. Um, we feel that it's the duty, our duty, uh, to residents of the area there to make sure that that bridge is put safe, uh, safe enough to carry uh, a typical load of 44 tons, and uh, so that they can use it and access their homes and businesses and farms uh, without further ado or as soon as possible. And in order to facilitate that, the uh, recommendation to us is that the council puts up a figure of £200,000 plus 5000 for cost consulting in order to get this done.
Thank you, Steve, Councillor James. It's more about the residences, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 So it's more about getting the local residents that access mm -hmm. the wire. Councillor Orger. Yeah, it's, it's a tale of woe, and you read through it, and it's just people slowly shoulders, nobody taking responsibility, no one gripping this up, and everybody's suffering. I am really pleased that uh, we, we are a council that actually uh, are willing to put these monies into it. Yeah. Um, it's a shame we have to do that. I'm sure there are better ways of spending that money. But at the end of the day, I'm really, really proud that we're doing that. One question I do ask is, is how quickly will the work be done once the monies are, are agreed? We'll come back to the okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I totally support this recommendation. I know uh, I've got a lot of family from Catesby, Hilton, and Staverton, um, and a lot of people I know in the surrounding villages work at the big hotel, or yeah. was the Pure Hotel, around the corner, and um, they suffer that road treacherous anyway. Um, so I fully support getting that piece sorted out as soon as possible. Thank you, Steve. Councillor Richie. I have a concern, Chair. That this sounds like subsidising a private company. The the company um, ERP is it? Um, when ERP took on responsibility for the bridge, they took that responsibility over from the HRE. I don't know what the different um, bodies, but they took on a responsibility. If they, if, they took, if they took ownership of it, they must have been fully aware, or if they weren't, they should have been fully aware, of what were the obligations that would go with it. If you buy a house, you find out what, you know, what the state of it is, what you might need to do to maintain it and prevent it from falling down. They have taken on this. It should, it should therefore surely be their responsibility. Why are we getting involved in getting a £200,000 subsidy to a company that probably didn't do its homework terribly well in taking on the, the responsibility for this bridge. I'd also be interested to know why, you know, if the... Um, I, I, I understand that it is the bridge uh, until it was closed was only taking weights up to 24 tons, I'm not quite sure, I'm looking at section, the second paragraph, 4.3. Oh, yeah. If it's only taking up to 24 tons, why have we got to strengthen it <coughs> up to, you know, up to 44 tons? It just strikes me that this is not something that is our responsibility. It strikes me as being fairly clear that it is the responsibility of the owner of the bridge. You read 4.4.1, the next paragraph there, we do nothing. We do, you know, we do nothing, but there is, but, 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 but there is surely an appeal if we have taken on the responsibility for, you know, for the maintenance of the bridge. Or somewhere in the papers, there's reference to the, the provision for requiring the government to intervene in this. Now, uh, we are in a position where we are being, um, you know, we are, we are facing millions in costs from the government that we are protesting about. Uh, over reorganisation and the things that we will need to do in the in the coming couple of years, and yet here we are in something that is not our responsibility. Um, it is a responsibility that you could argue more lies more with the county council, but the county council has a case for actually asking that the owner of the bridge takes action, and we are saying that we are going to put two hundred thousand pounds worth of um, of our residents' money into repairing this bridge. Now, of course, there is an inconvenience. I, 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 I know the bridge. I okay. have often walked my dog in that, in that particular area. And it's one of these roads that you can walk along with a dog and not going to lead very, very safely because you hardly have any traffic whatsoever on it. There are plenty of other roads around. There will be an inconvenience for a number of people which, which, which we have got to be concerned about. But I would not overstate it. Um, I'm trying to think of anywhere in that area where the detail that you would need to make is anything like six miles. Okay. I just, I, I just feel this doesn't strike me as something that is proper use of the district council's money. Okay, we'll come back to those points. Um, Councillor uh, Oswald. Good tongue in cheek, Chairman. I can say between long but being long but be war, yeah. there's a bridge being knocked out. It's been marked for several months and there's traffic lights there. Right, one was demolished in the car. County Council can't afford to put it right. Today I went to Spratton and had to go to Northampton 
and there's a bridge on that road between Spatton and Northampton that's been closed for about a year now. It was closed, rebuilt a bridge, and then demolished it again. Kenny Council can't afford to repay it. I suppose if this council, which is in his district, paid 50 grand for each of them, we could probably get them both repaired and uh, working with them. But I said it was tongue in cheek, Chairman. Yeah. I've got, uh, although I'm not left wing, I'm quite right wing. I've got, I can understand where Councillor Ritchie is coming from. And, um, I mean, one argument is right, we need this. Um, we need this to go ahead and this helps it to go ahead and it shows that we're interested in, in, in getting this to Daventry. And the other side is exactly what Councillor Ritchie is saying. Um, you are actually doing what he's saying. So I can, I can see both sides. Well, I can see both sides. If you look at 4.41, we do nothing and the rest of the uh, uh, inconvenience and uh, access. But also, <coughs> what I would say is, if you go for a local reorganisation, this council looks after this rural area, but when we become a bigger council, they the chances are it's be well off the uh, radar. Can't can't Do you want to answer some of the points I've been raising? Sure. I, think um, which particular. I mean, firstly, I would say, members, I appreciate this is complicated. Mm -hmm. It has taken us quite a bit of effort to understand the legal position. There's a chain of different bodies that have been involved. Um, I think the key point is even if um, pressure was brought to bear on ARP to uh, Bridge in accordance with what is probably, but not necessarily, its duty, it would only be to 24 tonnes, which means that most large modern uh, freight vehicles which do traverse these rural roads from time to time would be unable to cross it safely. That does not mean that they wouldn't cross it. Um, I was talking to the County Council's Highway Regulation Manager just today, who had a complaint from the local freight business that the County Council had reinforced the barriers along the bridge. It was pretty obvious from the conversation that they have been removing the barriers and driving the vehicles over the bridge, even though the road is closed. And I have to say, the risk of death of their drivers. So people do do these things. So it is far safer to achieve a 44 ton limit, which our contribution would achieve. Um, and the other very practical point is, I hear what he said, but we've reviewed all the options available to try and get something done, and we don't think any of them are very likely to achieve anything, certainly not in the, in the short or medium term. Thank you. Councillor Randall? Yeah, I agree with um, Councillor Ritchie and I wouldn't want to see the bridge made so 44 tonne vehicles could go over it because I'm thinking about that road and thinking actually where would 44 tonne vehicles go to or, or come from because that wouldn't be a route that I would think that they would use and I don't suppose the villages would like 44 tonne vehicles going through their villages either. So, and you know, listening to Councillor Osborne, like he says that bridge on the Long Buckley Road, I mean that is a really really busy road this road isn't so um, I would like to see us spending that money when it's not our responsibility Thank you Chancellor Randall or Cass Gilbert okay, um, Obviously this is in our ward mm -hmm. so I do support it yep. but not because it's in our ward mm -hmm. as such um, I do think it's well written report in that it's given all the options and Anyone reading this, I agree with Councillor Olga, you know, slopey shoulders. There is no option. Someone's got to do something, and we have a duty and a responsibility. Um, I also think you need to look at the significant harm, and that the, to the residents, and we're elected here for the significant harm at the moment with that um, bridge being closed. I take tongue in cheek with. Um, Steve's comments, for again, you look at the impact. Um, there's a the bigger impact I consider is on this bridge as opposed to other bridges that have been closed. <coughs> and then I have seen somewhere in the report that um, there could be an impact on the development, which was all about rejuvenation, etc., of the area. And also, um, the last point, which is moment, yes, that there is a possibility you can get the money back. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, there wouldn't be a cost. <laughs> okay, thanks, that, Joe. Uh, <laughs> Councilor Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I would say uh, we had an overly roll, like the concept of uh, sloping shoulders, and we would crack on, fix it, yeah. uh, make it happen. Thank Use you. our power and uh, influence and money. Mm -hmm. And the question was asked, actually, about timelines. Yes, timelines. How quickly can it happen? 
chairman, uh, potentially before Christmas. Oh, yeah, the room could be open before <laughs> Christmas. No, the, the work was done before Christmas, what you're um, It is possible for the bush to be open before Christmas. Yeah. I wouldn't want to promise that at this stage, no. but the contractor is available. Uh, there's a little bit of design work to do, and the council yeah. has to give approval in principle to the structural work, but the design's been done once already, so. Okay, thank you. I'll go to you, Councillor James. Back to you. If you want to thank Chairman. I'd just like to finish by saying that, that, that I hope that the uh, Council supports this recommendation because people of Child Robson in particular, I had a meeting with, along with Gary Underhill, with some residents from Child Robson. They've had a bit of a rough deal. They've always been cooperative with us. That road, if we use it like a racetrack, the A361, whizzing through Child Robson. So there's, they're waiting on some possibility of getting some funding from HS2 so that they can implement some speed reduction measures. Well, that's you know, a little bit of hope, uh, <laughs> hoping for something, wishing rather than wishful thinking. Okay, so we put forward the two recommendations, yeah? Yeah. Okay, fine, thank you. Yeah. We have a vote, it, please. Uh, those in favour of the two recommendations, shake hands. Those against? One. Thank you. That's passed. One abstention. Thank you. One abstention. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Your last one is, well, I thought last one actually, that's a good one as well. Adoption of the Economic Development Strategy and Procurement and Best Value Strategy. Councillor James. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, recently, we've uh, uh, undertaken a consultation exercise on the uh, district. <coughs> the government strategy and the corporate procurement and best value strategy. Uh, the consultation wasn't very well uh, supported, uh, but nevertheless, um, there were three or four uh, important organisations that were quite content uh, with what we were doing as far as the economic development strategy is concerned, which has its four. Uh, Priorities um, and the corporate procurement and best value strategy, of course, enables us to be a more efficient council, particularly about being able to bring in a much wider uh, <coughs> range of contractors. So I put that to you that the recommendation be approved. Thank you, Captain James. Uh, any comments and observations? Are you happy to support three recommendations? Three. Thank you. We're now going to a private session. There are